to the cloud and we are recording. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, this will be a continuation of the budget workshop that um, actually we may have adjourned. I don't know if we adjourned on Thursday the, the 7th. Um, if we did, I can, you know, reconvene the, the meeting of uh, the budget workshop for uh, Monday, May 11th um, with the uh, uh, town council and town departments. So if uh, everybody gets ready, we'll start off with, uh, I think, Kathy, you're going to present today for uh, Parks and Rec. And social and youth services. Perfect. Great. I thought I'd start with social and youth. Okay. That's fine. I'll let everybody can get caught up in their, uh, their binders if they want. which includes me. There we go. Okay. I'm good. All set. All right. I'll, I'll go through our social and youth services budget for next year. And I'm starting with our salary account. So right on the top of your sheet shows there's been no changes in positions with social and youth services. And the only increases you see there is our step increases per the um, union contracts. So that takes us right through um, our salaries and wages. I don't know, Mayor, if you'd like me to, to pause and see if people have questions or just keep going. I would go through the whole thing, um, at least the way I do it, I kind of take notes, but I'll let you go through. Don't lose your train of thought and just, just go one shot and then uh, we'll ask questions at the end. Okay. Um, then that brings us up to the benefits, which are the numbers that we get for the, from the finance department. And those numbers will just, um, are what they are, and they show a little decrease in the health insurance, only because a new staff member that came on went, the previous one went from family to individual. And that then brings me right to our travel training and dues account. And that account is pretty stable. It doesn't really change a lot. We have um, different trainings, licensure fees, dues for our state associations, and mileage when staff are out with their responsibilities. Next up is our professional services. And that's our dial-a-ride transportation. And you may recall that we came to council earlier in the year for the new contract that came in uh, $49,000 under what it was. And that was a combination of the bid came in very well and we, we, we reduced the number of trips that we asked for. So a combination of both gave us a savings there in that account. And along with that account, we also have our CRT lunch program for seniors, which is generally the lunch meal at the community center um, and that is um, set for next year. And obviously we have to watch and wait and see how this is gonna play out. Our support services deal with all our youth prevention programs. That account pretty much stays stable also. And um, we use those funds to assist with our juvenile review board, our prevention programs, and the different um, programs that come up in clinical services that we have. Our public contributions, those, uh, that for those funds of $3,000 go to three different community organizations that assist our residents with their mental health needs. And that's the, well, it's right there. It's the Intercommunity Mental Health, the Interval House, and the Regional Mental Health Board. So there are um, organizations there that we support. That brings us right up to our specialized agency supplies. And those are our, really our senior citizen programming funds. And so we keep that account also stable for next year. And that helps to offset the costs for senior citizen programs that are held in the community center. And then our general office supplies, that also hasn't changed. So our grand total, we're bringing the budget in under budget of $47,000 really because of the dial-a-ride transportation. 
that's a quick overview. Great. Um, I'll open it up uh, for questions from the floor. Anybody? Chair, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, Kathy, are you still providing the, uh, C the CRT lunches now, or has that program um, ended because of coronavirus? Or are you doing a, you know, are you doing a pickup type program now? Actually, what we did when this all first started, we were looking at that program and working with CRT, and they weren't sure exactly what they were going to do. So, um, and, and what what shape it would take because we were closing the community center building. So what uh, ended up happening is our senior center coordinator um, got a call from the Hartford Healthcare who was interested in helping us out with meals. And they actually are now for the time being delivering meals to the seniors that were on the senior lunch program. So instead of them having to come anywhere to pick up anything, Hartford Healthcare picked up the cost of that and that's serving almost 15 seniors that were on our um, lunch program. I'm great to hear. I'm glad to hear that. That's great. Thank you. That may change as we move further along because they said they could do it for a limited amount of time. And we're doing, uh, we're looking at plans now as to how to make that move forward when that ends from Hartford Healthcare. Because they actually picked up the entire cost of that. And, and how, are you, um, how are you getting um, groceries to seniors in need that may have transportation issues right now, you know, with coronavirus? A um, couple of different ways. We've, we're, we're still using the dial-a-ride transportation that is still available to our senior residents for doctors, groceries, and the food bank. So seniors do have the ability to uh, call up dial-a-ride to get a ride to come and pick up. And we also have um, some seniors that are helping out other seniors and either coming and getting both bags, uh, both amounts of bags that are going out or other neighbors are helping out. So you feel like, you feel like you're able to meet the needs of um, our elderly residents right now? Yes, and we're trying to encourage them to call us if there is an issue. Thank you. And along... Along that line, what I could tell you is our senior center coordinator, um, Amy, has created a volunteer bank of um, our residents, some of whom are members, that are literally calling all the membership of the senior center, checking in on them like every two weeks, just asking if they need help or anything, or, is, or do they know of anyone that needs help. So we're trying to reach out that way. So she's got about 10 volunteers and herself, and they're calling almost every other week, uh, a thousand members. That's great that there's that kind of community outreach to make sure people aren't forgotten. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Matt, did you raise your hand earlier? I did, uh, thanks, Mayor. Whether it's Kathy or Mary, Erica, et cetera, do you foresee, as we sort of move into the long term of the current social situation, any changing trends that we should be addressing now? I mean, obviously, we're talking about this budget coming into play July 1, and I easily foresee whether it's this, you know, strange unemployment trend, the strange unemployment trends because it was so hasty, uh, social trends, maybe everyone being together a little bit different. This is certainly not a time that is sort of a typical year after year after year. So in your department, which is social and youth services, what type of trending are you, will you expect that maybe we should be accounting for now uh, to be able to ensure we meet the needs of the citizens? I think that part of the trends we're seeing is we're not sure if senior centers will open for a while. So that's something we have to think about. We also have um, staff doing um, online different classes that were once held at the senior center that we're now having done online. So that's part of what we're looking at is still to keep that, uh, a lot of the exercise programs out there are online just to make sure we're working with seniors and meeting some of their needs. 
I'm also going to ask Erica to stop to, she's going to slide over on the chair and I'm going to get out of the way and give you more information on that. Good evening, town council members. Good evening. Mayor, how are you? Um, yes, I think we're going to, unfortunately, with this current crisis, I think we're going to end up seeing this be long-term effects in our department, given um, unemployment rates, food insecurities are going to, have we've already seen increased, are going to continue to increase. Um, different programs that we're running are going to have to be run a little different, but we know that there is going to be needs, and we've already seen the needs increase. Um, with people with housing issues, um, homelessness, um, as well as just mental health that has been affected with this, that we're probably going to see an increase of referrals needing to be made, domestic violence, um, we've seen increase. Um, so we're really taking that all into account. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but we know entitlement benefits are going to have more applications are going to have to be processed. Energy assistance is going to become more difficult. Um, in order to navigate all those applications and more people are going to qualify given the, their situation currently. Mm -hmm. And how about as it relates to any change that is in your particular programs and budgets? In terms of? Well, right now we're looking at your departments. So I guess specifically for this conversation, if we see society in this sort of seismic shift in a very quick term, whether it's everybody being together and all the rest of the things. We've obviously seen huge generate uh, generosity in the food, the food bank, but also huge use. So that seems to be sort of even even, but you're more on the ground talking to people every day and you might be able to see or foresee this type of trending. So, I'm at, so as we look at your budget, is there anything that we should be cognizant of that we may need to adjust in order, because this is not another, just a simply another year's budget, especially in social and youth services, considering what we have going on. Sure. Um, Kathy, you can jump in at any time, but I think we'll definitely, when we look under um, some of our professional uh, uh, support services, um, we're going to have to take a look at um, what are some of those clinical services that we might have to um, assist with, with people who are underinsured or not insured. Um, different types of, um, af you know, youth prevention programs. We're going to have to take a look at that um, in terms of just prevention as a whole. We have seen an increase um, in people's substance use go up. So I don't know how that's going to kind of play out in terms of, um, you know, needing those resources and those programs available. Did you want to jump in? Yeah. Yeah. So is that, is that a specific line item or area that we should be adjusting in our budget in order to accommodate that influx or that need? <laughs> I'm not sure yet. It's going to be a very hard call, Matt, to figure that out. I think that... Um, That's why I'm looking for advice from you guys that are on the ground, of course. Yeah, no, I understand that. And it's, it's hard for us to even give you a dollar number right now, just not knowing how... I mean, we could, we'd be making up a number and giving you an estimate. It's just very difficult to do it at this point. I think we're okay. We've had a, a, a lot of generosity from the community. So there's, we think right now the food bank is in, in good, is doing okay. We're getting a lot of donations for that in a variety of different ways. So right now today, that's looking good. How that will play out as we go forward with this, I think it's gonna always be an ongoing thing. And I think that, you know, we just have to look at it and watch it as we go through it. Okay. Okay. Thanks, so, Mike. Uh, no. A follow-up for that, Kathy. Could we, um, do you see, um, do you see some trends? Like if we looked at last April's numbers for food bank usage versus this April and the same with mental health and um, different services, you see a, a big, you know, uptick in all of those all of those um, programs? Yeah, we've definitely, there's definitely obviously an, an uptick in the food bank operation. We're, we're doing a lot more as the food is coming in, we're getting it right out. So we're making sure that we're giving people two things, enough food to last and also to, to minimize the amount of times they come here. 
So before we used to do one bag of food, you'd stuff it. And now we're doing two bags of food and getting that out. And t we're telling people to call us if that, that doesn't make it. We're hoping that lasts for a while. So we're looking at that. With the mental health, that's going to be an ongoing thing that we have to watch and see how that's going to play out. And there are a lot of resources out there and we're, we're, we're always being told about things that come up and we try to take advantage of them because those are all resources that are not from the town operating budget, but from different organizations that support these types of issues. Sure. And Erica has some input. I just want to make mention when we talk about um, serving the residents, we have seen a number of residents that we normally don't work with um, starting to call and look for resources. So I did think that was um, something to mention that we are seeing new residents, people that maybe have not been in the situation before, but are needing our services now more than ever and have find, figured out a way to get in contact with us. And we want to keep doing more of that outreach so people know we're here and we can try to direct them to the resources they might need. Are there any different resources that you've seen pop up, you know, in the last few months that are uh, either in severity or we sort of know the normal, regular social new ser social services that you provide. Mm -hmm. So anything new or different that is different now than before? That are coming to our attention? Um, yeah. It's it's a lot of the same stuff. I know unemployment, we've been getting a lot of calls with that. Um, people have not been able to navigate the system or they're getting um, help, held up at a certain point. So they're really looking for us to kind of um, help them navigate and um, try to get um, their unemployment set up. That has been um, a big issue. We've also seen some um, undocumented residents who this is infecting. And unfortunately, um, they're limited on the resources they can connect with when it comes to, you know, state and federal uh, benefits. So that is another area that we're definitely keeping an eye on. The other thing, Erica, if I can add in, I don't know if we've seen the adjustment, but because of uh, decompression at the state level in terms of um, shelters, there's a number of individuals that have been relocated for sheltering within town. <laughs> And that's probably something to consider as what that impact will be if um, to, you know, to your office in terms of providing for services. Uh, while the intent is once the shelters get back up and running for people to be back into the area where they were, there's always a percentage of individuals who technically are now relocated. So there is always in the back of my mind, since the state kind of mandated the decompression, that that is something to consider. Um, uh, in terms of the changeover in the population and, and the services that they may require through uh, our, our social and youth services department. Absolutely. And just to follow up on that, um, do we, there was an email from you, Gary, a couple weeks ago, about three weeks ago, with uh, one of the hotels down on the Silestine Highway, almost to the town, town line. Uh, have we seen residents move into that hotel? The, uh, yes. Um, I don't think we've had any concerns, although there's been, there was another hotel, I think, that you had to provide some assistance to uh, a resident or two, but people have, have moved into that location. Okay. And staff at the hotel are working with them and, as well as town staff, or is it just hotel staff and state resources right now? I think it's primarily um, state resources for the shelter decompression here, um, but we don't know how long they'll be in town with us. <laughs> so we are, you know, definitely open to if a need comes up to see how if we can best help or meet that need for those uh, for those shelter members. Gotcha. Uh, I just had a question. I did see the uh, dial a ride go down. Uh, the number of rides have have we seen um, because dialysis treatment, or maybe not dialysis that still goes on, but NEMT work, non-emergency medical transport work, uh, has that decreased at all over the, the last 60 days or so? It has, yes. We've gotten numbers so far from March and April, and we have seen a decrease given that 
you know, all proceed, a lot of procedures haven't taken place. Um, routine medical appointments are really not happening. Um, a lot of residents use it to go to the senior center to mm -hmm. go to physical activities and go to card games and bingo. So that's not happening right now. Mm -hmm. So yes, we did, we have seen a decrease in usage. Um, I did put a call out to the general manager of um, Curtain Transportation um, just to let him know that we're monitoring this and that, you know, if there's any way that we can have a discussion looking at our numbers going through the rest of the year and the beginning of the next fiscal year to kind of see where we can go from there. And he's very open to have that discussion and he will be talking to um, the owner of the company and responding. To <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Um. And as far as everything else, it, it, I mean, I'm just bouncing off of what Amy and, uh, and Matt had said, uh, we are, you know, it is a difficult time period right now. And, and, you know, as we start to see the unemployment go up, you know, the mental health issues start to, to arrive, obviously, you know, need for social support goes up. Uh, are we, and I, I, I believe it's through the schools, but we're starting to see now, instead of families uh, taking advantage of some of the free meals at the schools, that your residents are doing it as well, correct? Mm -hmm. um, this isn't just a, a program for those that have already been on the, the meal program. Correct. This, is, this is opened up to, um, to families in need. Okay. Yeah, I believe um, last week's numbers, um, they had um, between breakfast and lunch meals, they served about 4,000 meals. In one week. In one week. Yeah. Um, that's including breakfast and lunch. So, um, yeah, they their numbers have really increased. And we actually partnered and worked w with um, the school system <laughs> to, to provide a satellite um, lunch and breakfast location at Weathersfield Housing Authority because we realized that many of those families might not be able to make it to the high school. Right. Um, transportation issues or parents that have to work, um, uh, older siblings, taking care of younger siblings. So this way, three days of a week, um, we were able to coordinate with them um, and help them get access to the Weathersfield housing to provide uh, meals and bre breakfast and lunch there as well. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Tom? Yeah, maybe a question for uh, Kathy. Uh, sure. On uh, salaries and wages, it looks like we moved a part-time uh, senior center coordinator into the regular salary wage. Is that a change in position or just if you could explain why it's been moved? Sure, we just moved it up there just to, because uh, it's all taken out of the same account for accounting purposes. So it made sense to just move it up so it would all be in the same area. There's no changes at all. It's still a 30 hour a week. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anybody else? I have a quick question about, uh, I know you mentioned with the senior center being closed, you're doing some online programs. Um, what is the what sort of participation are you getting with those? Because I know seniors, I don't, well, I don't know. I'm just curious. <laughs> yeah, it surprised us too. It's, they're doing very well. They're probably doing 20 to 30 people in some of the different fitness classes. It's gradually gotten, I think as the word has gotten out, we've gotten more seniors to go in and um, be on mostly Zoom for that. Okay. And what's what is that about what would typically be there in person or is it less or more? What how does that compare? It's probably in terms of if it was if it was in the building, what are the numbers? It's yeah. probably a little bit more. And we're finding we're getting emails back from the seniors saying they really appreciate it and they're trying out some of the different instructors because they always had their favorites and now they're kind of taking the classes are free online. So they're, they're kind of bouncing around to different instructors to take advantage of it. And normally they wouldn't, would you normally have to pay for the classes? 
Yeah, if you signed up, um, these are um, kind of a continuation of the spring classes that we had to cancel. And so we did refund people's money for that. But we felt that we could afford to do some free classes to keep people active and involved. Okay. The other thing to consider when you do it free is if they've never done it before and they're not comfortable, you, you kind oh, of get of them comfortable with the idea of, of doing it. And now yeah, all of a sudden you hook them. For an online exercise class because there's so many free out there. I was just, I was just wondering if, if normally they would have to pay for the classes. I, 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 of course, I don't think they would pay for, a lot of people would pay for online <laughs> exercise classes. So it's great that you're doing that. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Erica. And we'll move. Probably stay with right with you guys. And do parks and rec, Kathy. Sure. A little bit higher of a budget, bigger of a budget. Yeah. <clears throat> we'll see how fast I can do this. <laughs> this is a little longer. In the Parks and Rec budget, again, I'll start with the salaries, and you'll see that this lists all the positions in the Park and Rec department. Um, generally, the same thing I said for social and youth, there are some step increases in there. The director is the 2% raise at this time, and the change is that we've added administrative clerk to from the Board of Ed, that's the building use scheduler for all the schools. So that was a discussion of uh, moving that position over to the town. So it's placed here in Parks and Rec. So you'll see that in the salary account also. So those are the, the salaries. Uh, again, benefits are um, kind of what they are. You've probably talked about them already. Uh, copy and binding, we cut those numbers for next year because with the dock ring permits, we're gonna be doing those, paying for those printing out of the boat fees. And with the pool passbook, we've now gone to the pool fobs at our facilities, so we don't need the printing anymore. So that's why we cut those items out of the budget. On travel training and dues, we're keeping that number the same and that's holding in with um, all of the training we do with staff and um, it covers our aquatics training, our workshops for staff, state conference, and things of that nature. The next item is our support services. Oh, let me, let me back up. I, one thing I forgot to say about the salaries, I forgot to mention our part-time staff salaries. Um, those are all the staff salaries that are all the part-time and seasonal people that are in the operating budget. And you're probably aware that the minimum wage has gone up in Connecticut and will be going up for the next several years. So as of September of this year, September of 2019, it went up to $11. October of 19, it went up to $11. And September of 20, it's gonna go up to $12 minimum wage. So that impacts this budget both in the summer for our summer staff and also for the fall staff. So I wanted to make sure I brought that information up just to have you be aware that that will have an impact on um, seasonal and part-time staff for the next couple of years. And we did try to reduce hours and look at, um, look at different things that we could do differently to try and make some of that up. And it's, it's just a big increase because it went from 10.10 to $11. So, that's a big increase for our seasonal and part-time staff. And I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. Um, so I did travel training and dues, which then brings me to our support services. This generally stays the same, except for we have, um, we do a partnership with the Board of Education, with the school district, with our early childhood coordinator position. So there's an increase there of, we've each put in $15,000 towards paying the salary of the early childhood coordinator, and the rest is covered by grants, and it's been a partnership. And the grant, uh, the people that, the different grants that we get have asked to see that the, um, 
the town and the board put a little more money in as we're receiving the grants. So um, each of us put in an additional $5,000, bringing our contribution on the town side to 20,000. And that account brings in a series of grant funds that since July of 2016, we've brought in almost $400,000 for different programs for early childhood here in town on both the town side and the board side. So that is that, that explains that $5,000 increase. Um, so that, I, I wanted to uh, bring that to your attention. And then when we go down, we have um, custodial services. That's just our pesticide control for the community center. And then it brings you to our utilities. And with our utilities, uh, what you'll see in the increases is strictly what the rate increases are. We kind of, uh, we do uh, estimates every year and use the current in the previous year to help us out with the estimates for next year. So that's why you'll see a bit of an increase in that for next year. So that takes the water, the um, electricity and the natural gas for next year, that's why the increases are there. Then that brings me to our um, rentals and facilities and equipment. And um, that those rentals have to do with two things. Uh, we do bus rentals for our summer programs, and we also do bus rentals for our therapeutic recreation, adult social programs, and Camp Sunrise Transportation, which is our regional therapeutic recreation summer camp for children. So um, that's what those budget items are. And basically we're showing them as holding the same at this point in time for next year. Um, office machinery is pretty, pretty standard. It's what we use to fix stuff. Um, our public service contributions, uh, Camp Sunrise, we also have to pay a fee for each camper that goes to the regional camp. So that's 19 campers at $625. Uh, the Memorial Day Parade is in there for next year at our regular $5,000 uh, amount. And then we do a senior citizen every month or every other month, we put an ad in the rear reminder and the seniors seem to like that. That gives them an update on what's going on with the senior programs here in town. which then just brings me to our repair accounts for both the community center and the Solomon Wells house. We're holding those the same. We don't have heating oil anymore. We converted to natural gas. And then our agency supplies, again, we keep those pretty, um, pretty standard in terms of what we need to operate in our parks and in our programs. Um, the chemicals are not in our budget anymore for the pools. And then our building materials and supplies, I would bring that to your attention because that's all our cleaning supplies and paper products for our, um, our facilities, the community center, the Wells House, the pools. And um, we're holding those at the same. We're, we're not sure how that'll play out as we move forward. That'll be an area to look at because obviously cleaning is gonna be of much more importance. And then our office supplies, we're holding the same. Um, our other supplies, we have our um, different um, holiday events that we have. As you notice, the Veterans Commission had asked for a, uh, uh, some funds to operate their commission and um, just because it, it's something new in other commissions that we do, we work with as, a, as advisory, they don't really have a budget either. So as we were looking for areas to make reductions, that was one of the areas we looked at. Our equipment, you see playground equipment and safety surfaces. That's all the wood chips that go under the playgrounds and they're done usually in the spring or and or the fall. And that's what we use those funds for and then for any little things that break. And where it says park improvements, the nature center operations, the nature center is a self-sustaining operation. 
they have to bring in all their, all their revenue goes to sustain their operations with the exception of two things. One is the uh, park and rec budget gives $4,100 towards the building for utilities. That covers the utilities average about, next year they're gonna average about 25,000. So that's just a little bit to go towards their utilities. And the other thing in the park and rec budget is the youth development manager position. And that person is half time in, on the youth services side of social and youth services and half time in the nature center operation. And they serve as the nature center director. So that's, um, that's a snapshot of the park and recreation budget. Okay, thank you. Mary? Um, I know you've delayed signups for the summer programs um, for Parks and Rec. When do you expect to make a decision about those? I know some towns have canceled them and some are waiting for guidance from the governor. Um, what do you, just let me know what you're thinking about that. Sure, we're, we're, um, we're currently in the process of evaluating everything. We are waiting on the governor's recommendations. We're expecting more information to come out May 15th. I got more information in an email late today. This morning, we had a meeting with the parks and rec directors, the town managers, and park and rec staff with the health district director, Charlie Brown, to talk about is there a way to look at being consistent across the district in what we do with summer programs. So that, that all went on. On this past Friday, our staff had a round table discussion with members of the Connecticut Rec and Park Association. So we're looking at everything to see whether or not we're gonna be able to meet what the requirements are that are gonna come out. They're, they're changing almost daily. And we're hoping that by May 15th, it's gonna be a little clearer and we're gathering information. Do we close? Can we open and do certain things? Can we provide childcare for essential workers? Do we wanna keep the pools open? Do we want places for residents to go this summer? And we have to do it looking at all the, um, the, the guidelines and restrictions coming out of the governor's office. So I wish I could give you an answer tonight, but we're working on it very diligently and staff are looking at different ways we can meet restrictions or is it gonna be um, like for tonight, I just got late tonight, I got what came out of the Office of Early Childhood that any sports camps that were like two or three hours in a day that didn't have a breakfast or a lunch are not gonna be considered childcare. So they have to meet the minimum of you can only have five people. So that just changed at four o'clock today. So. We're really looking at it. We postponed, as you said, we postponed our summer registration till June 3rd. So we could have an idea of what we were looking at and what it would mean. So I know that's not a complete answer, but that's where we are today. Okay. Um, I, I have a question also regarding the seasonal um, workers. You mentioned the minimum wage increase. I thought that seasonal employees, seasonal workers were exempt from that, and definitely people under 18. And I know it's, there's a lot of high school students who will be, you know, camp counselors and stuff. So are you, do, are you required to pay them the, the state minimum wage or can you keep them at the a, a lower rate because they're seasonal? A big part of our, our summer operations are the pools and summer camps. The pools where we're hiring lifeguards and water safety instructors with their um, very particular certifications, we need to um, pretty much pay minimum or above to make sure we're gonna get the qualified staff because you have to pay for those certifications. So on the pool staff side, we really have to make sure that we're competitive and we're also paying for the certifications that staff are getting and that they can be lifeguards, 
pool instructors, uh, pool directors, things of that nature. So it doesn't really impact them at all. And when we reviewed most of the staff that we hire for um, our camp counselor positions are generally 18 or older. We're looking for college students. And then we're hiring some high school students that can be an assistant to them. So it's a mix of things in that regard. So we're looking at, and there's also, when you look at that minimum, if you're under 18, there's also a certain number of hours you can work, the types of jobs you can do it in. It's a little restrictive and trying to figure it all out gets very complicated. So mostly of what we're doing is we're starting our staff at the minimum. Okay. Thanks. Amy? Um, Kathy, how did um, coronavirus impact your spring sports um, and spring programming? I know that, you know, there were sign-ups prior to the outbreak. So how did all of that, how's all that playing out now? Uh, with all the spring programs, as of March 13th, we had to cancel them. So what we had to do was issue either full or partial refunds based on what the program was and um, how long they had purchased like a pool pass or swim lessons. Swim, swim lessons were in the middle and our spring session hadn't even started yet. So we had to, we had to look at that. Um, so basically our programs did stop. We did end up putting on, uh, we did exercise classes and things like that online. But there again, it did amp impact um, <clears throat> pretty much our pool operations and our therapeutic recreation after school programs. So did you lose money in the spring, in the, for the spring? We definitely, yes. We're, we're, we're thinking our revenue estimates for this year where we thought they would be we're probably thinking we're going to be down about $40,000. And some of that is offset with not having to pay people for lessons and so forth, right? That, that is correct. We, we did those numbers to, for instance, the spring session, I did a, a sheet on some of our spring session programs and what, they, what we saved because we didn't have them and we weren't paying staff. So for the indoor pool, it was about $12,000 that we saved. Saved is the wrong word, but that's what we didn't expend in the budget. For our therapeutic recreation program, it was another $8,000 that we would have spent. Our park ranger that we would have started in April, right now we're not doing any of the, the programs or the sports in, in Mill Woods. So there's about another $1,000 there. And we canceled the Memorial Day Parade so we saved there both the staff, which was $1,200, and probably the $5,000 that's in the budget this year for the parade. So when you're looking at moving into the, the, the summer programs, are you hiring lifeguards? Are you hiring camp counselors right now? Or have you not even hired your, your people yet? My concern is um, that residents you know, rely on these camps for daycare during the summer. And as the governor starts to slowly open the economy back up, we'll have people other than healthcare workers and first responders who are going to need um, somebody to watch their children. And a lot of times the camps and, and programs that the town provide act as those, um, those programs. So I'm just wondering, you know, how that's all gonna play out for the people going back to work now when they start to open retail and and hair salons and all of that as, as well. Yeah, and we're aware of that too, Amy. We're looking at that and trying to determine what is gonna make the most sense and also look at the risk. So, yeah. so we're trying to balance both. And i I'd be honest with you, it's a difficult process as we move forward. Um, staff are talking, they're interviewing um, college students, high school students, and we're not making job, we're not making job offers. We're saying we have a job for you, but we're not sure that, we're not sure how we're gonna move forward with this. So we're hoping they'll stay with us because uh, we can't, we, we're not hiring yet, 
but they know that if we do hire, they have a job. It's kind so of you a, could you could be up and running July first or June fifteenth or whatever the governor determines is a date for opening of some programs. You would uh, most likely be able to open, you know, in some fashion as the governor deems it appropriate. That would that would be our plan. At least that's that's how we're approaching it. Um, when you look at the summer camps, I mentioned earlier that they just came out and said two or three hour sport camps don't count. Some of the restrictions they're looking at is for every site or facility, you could have maximum of 30 children and they could be 10 in a group and that 10 has to have their own room and they can't mingle with the other 10 and 10 kids that are in other rooms. So if just by listening to that, would that in your mind mean there's no swimming lessons this summer? Or is this just for camps? Because the pools are a big issue and I know you have to open pools and start working on them and maintaining them you know, a month or two before you actually use them. So that was my next question. Are those, are those things starting now? We have started getting the pools ready because you have to start that in early March to start going. And they actually had, I was told they had already started even before we had actually this had all happened, kind of getting everything ready to go. So you do, we did start that and um, we're not sure about swim lessons. Be, there'll be, we believe that any of the lessons that require the instructor to be in the water with the child probably can't happen because of the social distancing. So you're looking at every piece of it to see what's, what's gonna make sense. So lessons are that we don't know. So, um, but then we thought, well, if we don't do lessons, then maybe we open the pool in the morning for the public. So we're trying to determine what's gonna be the best way to move forward, talking with the other people in our health district, talking to the health di district director and determining what, what is that risk with, with it going forward. Okay, and my last comment is I'm glad you're looking at it collaboratively with other towns in our health district because you never want Weathersfield to be the town that didn't open the pool and the <laughs> Newington and Rocky Hill did. So I am glad that we're you know, we're looking at it as a bigger group than just our one town. And hopefully we can, you know, figure out a way to make it where it's safe and, and um, you know, the kids have something to do. So thank you. And it, it's going to be, um, it's going to be difficult. I'm not going to tell you, it's going to be a complex process that we're hoping to do. And then we kept thinking we'd have it all done this week. I'm not sure because it keeps changing. And, and credit to Kathy's group. I've, I've had many conversations with her about this and they keep running different iterations and different examples and different what ifs and trying to uh, kind of value add it and, and evaluate different ways to do it. And really it is coming down to on a daily basis, sometimes multiple times a day, you're getting a different line from state government, Department of Public Health and CDC. And uh, again, to Kathy's credit, every time she gets thrown a curveball, she tries to come up with a way to modify it and and evaluate the pros and cons of both. Okay. Um, those were, a lot of those were my questions. Um, Kathy, as you know, you and I've talked plenty of times about parks and rec issues and minimum wage uh, increases. Um, obviously, I've had the same concerns about uh, opening of pools as well. Um, Gary and I have talked, <laughs> I don't know how many times in the past 10, actually I talked to Charlie on Friday uh, about some uh, issues with the uh, opening of the pools as well um, in all sports. You know, I know the governor's executive order with the limiting of um, 30, no more than 30 kids and then no more than 10 per group. If we did do that, though, most of your day camps or youth camps are at the community center, if I'm not mistaken, and you would be able to break them down by groups of 10? 
Um, yeah, we have the ability at the community center to do um, groups of 10. We don't, but they're, they're also saying you could only do 30 at a facility. Oh, okay. So yep. we'd, have to, we'd have to evaluate that so we could do one group of 30 in three different rooms, but the building's pretty big. Do we, do we start out small and do that, or do we try and do one wing and another wing? And the state, as it, and so far, has said you could apply for a waiver, mm -hmm. and, um, and we're, we're evaluating that, too. So do we put one, like, at the gym end of the building and one camp at the west wing end of the building? Okay. Because we're, we're hearing that senior centers may not, probably aren't going to open. Right. Right. And we were originally juggling how could we do seniors. We couldn't do seniors in the same building with the kids. That wasn't going to make sense. And we were thinking of moving them if we could get into a school. But then that all changed because they don't really want the seniors out anyways. And we agree yeah. with that. Right, right. That's the vulnerable population right now. So And we do that. camps in other places. The Nature Center has a camp. Uh, yeah. We do a dance and drama camp at Silas Dean Middle School. We haven't explored yet if we can even get in the schools. So there's a right. lot. There's a lot going on. Yeah, no, I know. No. <laughs> there was a concern. Yeah, yeah. There was a concern about schools whether or not they would open the schools up because a lot of them have done a deep clean already. Yeah. You know, you don't want anybody in the building prior to school starting um, in the fall. But you, you also have summer school that starts up in the next couple of weeks. And I believe the governor's office has said that summer school would be going on. So there, there may be some activities at school. Um, do, does our Parks and Rec, do they provide a, um, a camp in conjunction with the summer school programs? I know summer school is usually about a half a day, but for those families that work a full day in, in the summer, they would put their kids into a, a, a youth camp for the second half of the day. That works with our, we do that with our therapeutic recreation program. That program okay. actually doesn't start till 1130 because oh, okay. in the morning they're, but we have to, we have to check that out because generally the kids are bused to the community right. center. Yep. So we have to, we have to see what, what's going to happen with busing because we're kind of, the message we're getting is there's not going to be any busing. So we have to see what that means. Mm -hmm. And um, we also run, we've always tried to run what we call a playground program that we try to keep that cost as reasonable as possible for a six week program. It'd be about 235, 250 for the summer kind of thing. And it didn't have any frills. You'd be, and you could, if the parent wanted to drop you off after summer school, they could do that. You could sign up for that. Okay. Good. Um, anybody else have any questions? I got a couple questions on salary, but if anybody else has any question on programs or anything like that. One more quick question. So is it fair to say that if the summer programs run, there are not going to be as many programs or accommodate as many kids? And I'm sure that fewer kids will sign up because parents are still nervous about even letting their kids go out with, you know, among a group of other kids. Um, so in light of that, or I'm just trying to anticipate like whether you will be even needing to hire, even if the program's run, if you will be needing to hire as many um, counselors as you do in normal years, um, you know, just, or in, I know you'll, do, and do you think you will know, have this information or be able to provide us more before we pass the budget, you know, before the end of the month? A um, couple of different things on that. So, first of all, most of our summer camps are uh, self-sustaining. They're not in the operating budget. So, staff always has to do a budget of what their expenses are and then what the fees are going to be and how the fees are going to cover the expenses. And along with covering the expenses, the programs also have to bring in some extra revenue because we give, Parks and Rec gives the town a certain amount of revenue every year that comes from our programs. So there's a couple different pieces to that. So when we do the operating, so when we, when we do our summer camps, we look at all that. 
Um, and the only, the only big programs that are in the operating budget that have the summer or seasonal staff or year round staff are our pool operations, both indoor and outdoor and our playground program. And the playground program is almost self-sustaining. We just help out a little bit with it, with the operating budget. And we continually look to make more things self-sustaining. So when we look at what we're going to have to, so for 30 children, we might still have to use a lot of staff because if you're putting 10 kids in one room, you used to be able to shear staff. And, and so if you had 30 kids and you had three staff and they were all out in the grass playing, that was a good ratio depending on the age of the children. But now if you've got 10 kids and you're taking them somewhere out on the, uh, the grass at the facility, we might need another staff person. So we have, to, we have to look at that too, but that would have to be built into the cost of the fee because that's not in the operating budget. Okay, so the, so the positions in the operating budget, they're just the pool and the playground programs or people relating to work at the pools and the playground program? And the therapeutic recreation program. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay. Just a couple quick question, quick questions about the budget. Um, the showmobile that's always in here for roughly the amount of money. 3000 I think, this year. Mm-hmm. Um, what does that cost entail? That cost is for when we use that showmobile in town, there's a cost to put, uh, to have the maintenance people staff it because they basically run that piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. So that requires two staff members to run it and take care of it, bring it, set it up, the whole thing. So that covers the overtime for the showmobile. We may see that you know, it, it's not used for the Memorial Day Parade this year. The Keeney Cooler concert series, do we Thank see you. that? Yes. Um, there's four of those, I believe. Um, that's, that's five uses. Any other uses that the showmobile is going to be used at? It's used for the Keen, um picnic in September. Yep. September. Uh, what, what Graduation. Else? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Graduation. Graduation, yeah. I should. Uh, holidays on Maine. Oh, no, we don't bring it there. Sorry. I was going to say, that might, that corn, may still. Corn Fest. Yeah, we might get that in. It does go to Corn Fest. Corn Fest. But there's no Corn Fest this year. So no graduation, no Corn Fest, no Memorial Day Parade. Wait Can a minute, wait a minute. There may be graduation. Don't cancel on me yet. <laughs> no <laughs> large <laughs> gatherings. So. Yeah, we've already had all that stuff this year in this year's budget, but for next year's budget, certainly could be looked at as we move forward. Yeah, we may, we may real. I mean, it's three thousand dollars, but you know, when you're rubbing two nickels together right now, you kind of are looking for what you can. And I don't want to nitpick, you know, dollar for dollar, but if we could realize a couple savings and it goes just in line with Keen and Mikey's place, the the five Ks. Um, yep. We may, you know, look, if we can look at some overtime savings and some, some police savings, um, you know, if we can materialize some of that, that would be great. Um, electricity usage and natural gas, uh, again, that both in line with what we've already talked about. If the use of uh, Solomon Wells is decreased because of uh, um, any kind of restrictions and uh, the community center. I see we have a savings anyways. Uh, electric electricity at Solomon Wells goes down about $200, uh, about $3,000 or a little less at community center for natural gas. Mm -hmm. um, would we realize any of those savings going forward next year? Um, if we're closed. Yeah. If yeah. We're closed. yeah. Yeah. And we were, lo we've looked at when we're closed this spring, with the bills that we've received, we've seen some savings there this year. Okay. Yep. Yeah, if we could realize some of those savings. Do we know why the natural gas at Community Center went down about 3000 I think we're just more efficient with the, well, this year it was a little warmer. But what's the request going for next year? 
drops it down. Well, we did it based on the, the estimated um, uh, kilo, kilowatt, no, that's electric. Kilowatt hours. The CCFs, I don't know. Based on whatever we used, the, um, we estimated this year and looked at last year for next year. Okay. Yeah. Um, it just seems like it's, we're at, everything else is going up. Solomon Wells, the bigger, biggest one is community center. 16, almost 17,000, 18, 5, 25, and then goes down to 22. We just saw the big jump between 18, 19, and 19, 21, 19, 20. So, hey, if we could, you know, realize some savings on that, that would be great. Um, and then for the salary, it just looks like we are on, you know, FICA and workers' comp is going down. Is that because of the therapeutic rec position and the assistant director decrease? That's, I'd, I'd um, ask, for, I would check with Michael Neal on that. Yep. I'm not sure. They just give us those numbers. So honestly, gotcha. I wish I could answer it for you. Okay. Yeah, we'll be talking to Mike, but just wanted to see where they come from. I'll flag it. Um, Kathy, would, Kathy, you want to, would you just talk to the fact that you had a lot of um, staff moving positions because of a retirement? Um, so it looks like some of this cost savings could be through the retirement and then moving your staff around in positions. I don't know if everybody realizes how that, what that movement looked like within your department. Sure, we had our assistant director retire after 40 plus years. And um, so that, that made for some internal um, promotions. So people were able to move into different positions based on going through an interview process. So we've had people move into um, higher level positions, starting at their um, the lower rate of each position. So we anticipate there's going to be savings there, but we don't know how the retirement impacts the salary account. So that would be another finance question. Yeah. Just to find out exactly, it's very hard for us to estimate what those retirement costs are against the salary account. Gotcha. Yep. So Sal liked to travel, but he didn't like to take any time off. He only did, you know, <laughs> little blocks here and there. And he never got sick. <laughs> and he never got sick. Well, he did break his ankle, so he was out for it. That, that is true, but, but he learned how to work remotely before any of us. Mm -hmm. God bless. And what I should finish with, which with the internal movings and people moving, it then created an, a position opening for a therapeutic recreation supervisor. And right now that's vacant. Mm hmm Okay. Anybody else at all? Up, oh, Tom? Yeah, just to go back to the natural gas. So I have a uh, year to date. Uh, we're only 50% of our 28,688 budgeted. So... We didn't use nearly as much gas as we anticipated this past year. That is, that is correct. And actually, when I did my numbers, let me just look it up here. I'm showing about uh, like a savings of 7,100 because of the, building, the buildings have also, we don't have people in the buildings. Yeah. Right. This was dated uh, 423. 423 that shows almost 14,000 remaining. So we probably got another month's bills in since this. Yeah, we probably had, yeah, we have, yeah, it would be the April bills. Yeah, well, keeping in mind part of March was kind of mild. We're, right. We we're, were pretty mild until it snowed on Saturday, but other than that, you know. Yeah, March was mild and then April was cold. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, there should definitely be savings there. Yeah, yeah, we're 
flagging that across the board yep. just because of you know closure what we could recoup in savings and possibly carry forward okay anything else so we can get everybody going and not stay until 10 o'clock tonight if that's good for kathy mary and erica we're good all right thank you very much no thank, thank you. you thanks kathy take it easy derek i see you down there engineering yes Good evening, everyone. Hi, Derek. Hi. <laughs> um, so I'm going to present for the engineering department. Um, just to give you a quick overview, some of our primary functions are we provide project management, survey, design, uh, construction inspection services, responsible for all the improvements that go on in the public right of way. Um, just to give you an idea on volume in <clears throat> the last three years, on average, we'd issued about 49 licenses, so that's 49 different contractors each year working in the right-of-way, and averaged 415 permits. Um, now that's over a construction season, which is usually about eight months, eight to nine months. So um, we see a lot of volume as far as what's going, coming through the office, uh, as far as work that's going on. So uh, like Kathy, I'll just, I'll go through each um, different category and uh, you can stop me if you like, otherwise we could uh, talk at the end. As far as salaries go, uh, myself, my operations coordinator are the same. You will notice a change with our admin and administrative analyst uh, to a project manager. Our administrative analyst recently transferred over to the finance department. She had an opportunity to go there. And um, just looking at staffing and looking at some succession planning with some of my staff that are getting closer to retirement age, um, it gave me an opportunity to think about how, how, I, how I'm going to need to staff the department going forward. Um, my thoughts were, I do need an administrative analyst, but I've been speaking with the town manager about other options to get that work covered. I really am in need of more field people. Um, just related to the permits we're talking about um, that we issue every year, the different programs we administer. Um, I just feel I need more people available in the field for that type of work. So my proposal is to change the admin analyst uh, to a project manager that would be handling field. The reason, the other, that's one reason. The second reason is uh, my operations coordinator, uh, as I mentioned, he's one of the ones that's getting uh, close to retirement. He manages the projects for me in the field. Um, when I, when he does retire, I'm gonna lose a lot of institutional knowledge and ability. He, as well as doing our construction operations management, he is also our, uh, primary, he's our chief land surveyor, our licensed land surveyor, as well as our GIS coordinator and our inland wetlands agent. So he really has four different roles. Um, my thoughts are when he does end up retiring, I'm looking to have this person step into the uh, construction management and the inland wetlands roles. Uh, at that time, I will probably, I'm expecting need to replace him with a professional land surveyor as I need to have one on staff. So looking ahead, this, this by bringing this person in, they'd hopefully have an opportunity to have some overlap um, before my operations coordinator retires and that would give them some opportunity to train and kind of get up to speed with how we're doing things and what's going on in town. So that would be helpful. The other positions, senior survey tech, engineering tech two are the same. My engineering technician part-time, that's my sidewalk inspector. He works about half time. Um, you know, we've talked about in the past, I, everybody knows the conditions of the sidewalks in town. Uh, he does manage our sidewalk contractor who's doing different work. He also um, goes out and ins does inspections when he can or responds to complaints and issues services <laughs> to private property owners. Uh, but there's really almost so, so, only so much he can do each year. So um, that really needs to be a full-time position, but we do the best we can uh, with him being part-time. That means sometimes my staff or myself are pulled away from other tasks. If the sidewalk issues come up, it's the day he's not working here in town. Contractor has questions we have to go out and, and cover. Um, but I'm looking to continue keeping him on, on board. Um, our commission clerk does just meeting minutes for our in the wetlands commission because we do staff does serve as the liaison. Um, item number eight there, EOC coordinator, uh, spoken with finance and uh, town manager. I believe that 
is going to be transferred over the town manager's budget and out of mine on for future years or for this year going forward. So I believe that $8,000 will be coming out of my budget. Getting into salaries, wages, um, the regular benefits, um, the health insurance went up quite a bit. I'm up about 23,000 just in health insurance. Overall, these are up about 39,000 for the department. Copying and binding, uh, so just our business cards, uh, miscellaneous printing that we might have to do. Sometimes we need full size plan sets made um, if they're too much for us to do in house. The next section, uh, travel training and dues. Those are dues for different professional organizations. Um, we have, uh, you know, American Public Work Association. Um, my land surveyors have some associations that they have. It's the license for myself as the professional engineer and my professional land surveyor. And then um, just generally, if we need new reference materials, um, conferences and training is what that budget consists of. Moving down to office machinery service. Uh, we have a contract for two large scale plotters that we use, one's color, one's black and white for when we do our, our plots for uh, different projects that we're working on or uh, when we're working with different contractors and consultants. So we have a contract for the plotters. We have our supplies that we, we need for those and that's where um, that budget comes from. Moving on to the second page, uh, repair and maintenance proposed equipment. Um, you see that there's been a large increase in the line striping. I know a few years ago we talked about not striping the parking lots every year, which we did stop doing. So we've been rotating uh, one year primarily all the schools get striped and then the next year it's the it's, schools are not striped and the town lots are being striped. Um, what's happened this past year is the crowd bids came in higher than they have in the past. So that $50,000 is is about what I think I'm gonna need based on the current pricing that's out there right now. Um, Krog does that bid every year. So we usually have been working off of it. It seemed like all the bidders across the board had bid a little bit higher this past year. So that is still representing doing half the parking lots as we have been and then doing all the striping that's in the town right away. Survey equipment maintenance is for our, is what it says for our survey equipment. Sidewalks for $35,000, that's routinely in the past been in my operating budget. That goes to repairs that are required along town properties or repairs that are needed for um, areas in front of private properties that have been impacted by town trees. We usually utilize um, almost all those funds every year uh, through our sidewalk program. CCTV drainage inspections. Um, our pipe inspections, when we need to look at drainage issues, we have a lot of drainage issues throughout town. A lot of times, uh, the best way to find out what's going on is to find out what's going on with the pipes. Sometimes they're blocked. Sometimes we have slip points that are creating problems. So that, uh, that request gives us an opportunity to look into those. This past year, I expended all the funds. I have some more locations that I've just put on hold until I can get more funds to continue with the work. Ms. Liang's drainage improvements was noted. I had put in a request for $25,000. That's something I've asked for previous years. The reason why is we just have, a, like I said, a lot of drainage issues. We aren't able to pull a lot of capital funds to drainage. That would give me an opportunity if I need a couple catch basins and a couple sticks of pipe somewhere to address a problem to have money to be able to do it. I really don't have that right now. Um, you know, what I usually would do is try and work through physical services. Maybe they have some funds for that type of small work. And talking with the town manager, you know, since this hasn't been something I've had in the past, we felt that was a, uh, a line item that we could take out. So that wasn't put forth. Wetlands flaggings, we use that on our projects when we need a soil scientist to go out and flag wetlands for different projects that might need planning and zoning or in the wetlands commission approval. Repair maintenance, uh, that was, yeah, you know, we did cover that. Legal advertisement, that's just for as serving as the liaison for the Inland Wetlands and Watercourses Commission when we have to do advertising. Specialized agency supplies or different types of equipment that uh, and, and items that my surveyors usually need in the field. And those could be hubs, stakes, monuments, um, tools for doing their work. Uh, clothing is self-explanatory. The, my staff does have a contract for safety boots every year um, that they often will utilize safety vests. Um, you know, we buy a ton of Weathersfield, some sweatshirts and stuff with them for them to wear when they're at, uh, at work. 
general office supplies, that's just our general supply needs. Uh, IT equipment and software, that is our survey and engineering software. We had a slight reduction in, in the Carlson software uh, as far as the maintenance agreement, so we took that out. The rest of them are really the same. Those are different uh, softwares we use for drawing up plans, doing hydraulic calculations. Our GIS software that I mentioned, our operation coordinator updates continuously, so that way we have as good information as possible available to the public and also for use in-house by staff. Uh, equipment, uh, I had mentioned that the emergency operations coordinator, coordinator stipend was coming out. This was, uh, this was also coming out. This one was taken out of $1,000, so that's why that's been dropped to just $400 uh, this coming year. So overall, it's, uh, it's put forth as an increase of about seven, a little over 7%. Um, as I mentioned, that does include the stipend that will be coming out. About $39,000 of that is salary and benefits, and the, the remaining 16000 is really comprised primarily of the additional cost for line striping and the request for increase in the drainage inspections. So, happy to answer questions. Amy? Just one, just one quick one. Um, when you um, you went from the administrative analyst to the project manager, um, are both of those positions still within the same union and at the same um, level in the union? Yes, that was something we were uh, we had considered when we were talking about options. It is a new position in the union. Uh, that needs to go through that whole uh, approval process. I believe it's been discussed president, but yes, we were looking to keep it in the same union and it's at a similar salary range. Okay, thank you. And it's currently vacant. Yes, there is no one in that position right now. Is there, is, um, is there an add out? Is this an active, um, is this a position you're actively hiring for at this time? The we project manager have... one, no, we were waiting for get through this process. Um, as far as handling the administrative work, I know if uh, there's town manager has some thoughts on how we can cover what we need uh, for our my department and some of the other ones that she was assisting. But this is a position that you are looking to fill. You're not looking to hold off on filling this. Is there's a critical need for this to be filled? That's correct. Yeah, okay. in a perfect world, we would have had it filled already, but COVID struck. Yep. Um, and so the whole process of dealing with the uh, correct description, ensuring to get it out there, um, you know, figuring out, we're, we're trying to figure out how to use staff in the most creative way prior to COVID hitting and, and how we stretch additional resources so that Derek still has the coverage. It's not just Derek. I mean, this position supported uh, engineering, building, planning, fire right. marshal, maybe a little bit of blight here or there. Um, only as a secondary support. So it's really counter coverage. Um, pro and con, right, with COVID, we had to lock the doors for the most part. So we're still providing the service, but we don't have as many walk-ins. So it does allow us to control the flow. But in, under normal circumstances, the pressure without having something in that position, and to Derek's point, having someone to help with project management based off of not only current need, but future need, um, it's just a position he can't do without. Um, Frankly, I think Derek was in almost every day bugging me for it until COVID hit and, uh, and even then some, so. Thank you. That's okay, Derek. I don't hold it personally. I, you had to advocate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else at all? Mayor, before we move on from, and case unless someone uh, have questions, Derek, we might need to touch, if we could touch on your CIP or CNEF um, related projects, I can actually bring it up. Okay. Um, bear with me while I share screen. You just want to kind of run through, start at CNEF. I can't recall what's on here for you, so let's just take a look. Uh, and the line items 18 and 19. All right, engineering, so traffic counter and the suburban. Yes. 
Yeah, the traffic counter uh, is a equipment that we put out in the roads when we need to uh, study the traffic flows, volume, and speed. It's, you might have seen it's the small black wire that goes across the streets and you drive over them. We've had a counter for, for many years, it's gotten to the point where they are no longer going to offer service for it. Um, it's still working, although the company is not offering service anymore. So, and being at the age that it's at, that was a good time to try and uh, replace that because we do utilize it quite a bit, um, more than I would have expected we would. But whether it's, like I said, different studies, sometimes for app funding applications, they want to know traffic counts. Um, Walker Hill Road's coming up. We may be doing some counts out there as part of that reconstruction project. So that was that request. Uh, item number 19 for the Suburban is the, we have a Suburban that the survey, that's used as a survey uh, vehicle. It carries around all the equipment that they have, um, that they need, and that some of that sensitive electronic equipment. So ours is, our Suburban's just gotten to be very old. Um, it's in and out of the shop quite a bit. Uh, we've had issues with the brakes. Uh, so I'm just trying to get it on the radar as something that we do need um, in, the, in the near term. So I put in the request for the issue. And then for CNEF, oh, sorry. No, anybody had any questions on that one right there? No. Go, I, yeah, sorry, Gary, go through the, the full one. Oops, wrong button. Uh, and then uh, it's just falling off. Oh, we should do road funds too. All right, so and this is training sidewalks. I think I have a breakdown in here. Yeah, capital budget by funding. Okay, um, so starting at the top, town dam repairs. Uh, we've had a consultant uh, come out and evaluate all our dams uh, over the last couple of years. There are nine that are owned by the town. Um, they inspected eight of them. Um, the one they didn't was Cloverdale Pond because we had just recently reconstructed it. They identified some minor repairs that are required. The DEP wants the towns to uh, you know, follow through on getting that done. So the request I think was $50,000 CIAC, <clears throat> gave me 25,000. That allows me to get a consultant on board, um, start the process of permitting. There's gonna be um, both local, federal, um, potentially uh, state permitting required as part of this. So that can get us started on the project. Um, all, you know, multiple dams have some, like I said, I call them minor repairs because they're not as extensive as say Bell Pond Dam where we have significant structural issues. We've discussed in the past or other dams. Um, but sometimes it's just trees growing along the embankment that, that could jeopardize the stability of the dam. Um, it's, a, it's a variety of things and washouts that are occurring that we want to get fixed. So that's what that one's for. Uh, item number two, Not Street and Heather Drive has been a project that's been on the list uh, four plus years because it was on the list before I got here. We have icing issues at the intersection of Heather Drive and Not Street. We have groundwater that percolates up through the surface and it causes a safety hazard. So with this, this is a drainage system. We have to put some drainage pipe in from that intersection running west along Knott Street to tie into the existing system. So this project would allow for that. Um, one of the reasons I'm really trying to push that is that we're getting close to where those roads are gonna need to be on the paving program. And obviously we wanna take care of the underground infrastructure issues before we do that. Uh, pavement maintenance, Straddle Hill area road settlement. This has been an area where we've had a lot of issues uh, recently with sinkholes forming. It's neighborhood wide. We have been uh, working with MDC because the issues are both over sanitary sewers as well as storm sewers. So both of those types of systems are seeing settlement issues. Uh, sometimes they're every 10 feet you see a sinkhole forming. We did do uh, pipe inspections and determined that there really is no issues with the pipes themselves. Um, we've done some test pits. They've, NBC's been out there digging for some repairs they needed to do in the area. Uh, we think it's a groundwater issue that's causing some of the problems and probably issues when it was constructed uh, back in the mid 80s that they might have not followed some of the proper procedures, maybe with backfill material, not with high groundwater conditions that we may be experiencing because of the wet spring, particularly we had last year's causing problems. So 
that's really just to get me a consultant on board to do some further investigation out there and give us some recommendations how best to repair it for the same reason that those roads will be coming up on a future paving program and we want to address this obviously before we invest in the infrastructure of the road surface. Uh, let's see, so uh, school buildings, not mine. Uh, going down to sidewalks, um, I typically uh, have asked CIAC, this, this goes hand in hand with the $35,000 uh, sidewalk funding request in my operating budget. This also goes through our sidewalk program. We utilize these funds for replacing sidewalk ramps along our paving program, which is required by the U.S. Department of Justice. We also use it for replacing sidewalk ramps in other areas of town that are in need of repair, either through uh, complaints we got or just um, knowledge of the area. So when we do pave a road, it is a requirement. That's primarily where these funds go to. So they had recommended that. Uh, let's see, none of the rest of those are mine. I think that's it for what was in there. Okay. Um, just in keeping consistency with, sorry. Um, if you want to I have no issue with it, if there's things within here you want to, of the things that I took out, if you want to mention them, you can, if not. Yeah, sure. I'll just give a, a quick uh, explanation. So item number two, traffic sign inventory. A um, number of years ago, FHWA, which is Federal Highway Administration, put out mandates for towns to have a system in place to be able to manage their signs, their traffic signs, make sure they have the proper retro reflectivity. So at night they're bright enough for people of all ages and drivers of all ages to be able to see properly. We don't have a formal system in place and we don't have a, a good database on what's out there for signs. So that $50,000 was to get a consultant into town in, at one time over a period of maybe three to four weeks and survey all of our signs, get us pictures, get us dimensions, check the retro reflectivity that we can add to our GIS database and manage it through that system. So we would be able to identify what signs are immediately in need of repair and those that we can plan for future uh, CIP projects for. So that was that. Um, the item below it, Straddle Hill Area Road Settlement, uh, that was an additional request I had uh, initially to CIAC um, in talking with them, I felt like they could cut it back and I could still get going at least on the uh, hiring the consultant. Some of this money would have been some for some more extensive road repairs, but you know, at least if I can get the consulting work done, then I have a better idea what costs are going to be. Uh, next one was town dam repairs. I discussed that in the last, that was also just a reduction. We had asked for 50 so we could start the permitting process with a consultant and also start some of the repairs. Uh, what I'll probably do is just pick the worst one or two and probably have the permitting and the repairs done on those and then seek fund future funds for the remaining locations. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, I guess that was it for, for mine. Mayor, can I just um, say something while we're still on that page? Oh. Yep. I'm realizing I should have given, given Kathy an opportunity, too, to talk about hers, but I don't think she's still on. Um, well, I, I apologize. I had to leave <clears throat> the last meeting a little early. I had a family issue, um, but I did go back and watch what I missed um, today. It was a long meeting. But there are two items on this list that I just wanted to see if we could get uh, maybe Sally to comment on. Um, one of them is the town hall chiller uh, and mechanical support system. Uh, that's not being funded. And I thought we heard a lot in the, the last few budgets that, that this was uh, the last component to that and that it was something we de desperately needed to keep the heat and air conditioning at the library and town hall running. So can we um, check with Sally, get an assurance that that system is going to stay up and running? And then the other question was regarding the 50,000 for um, web masonry stair replacement. Can we find out if this is a safety issue or if it's just um, aesthetics? Those were my uh, two concerns with this list that I just yep. would like to get addressed before deliberations. Yep, I'll could, have her I, give her opinion on it and, and, and then we can discuss. Derek, is one of them I, yours? Yeah, well, it, it, is, it is Sally's, but I was working with her on that. Um, we have issues at the main entrance coming off of Willow Street that are significant deterioration of the stairs. So yes, it is a safety issue. 
There's also an issue with some of the stairs coming in off the parking lot on the north side of the building. We had our uh, last year's sidewalk consultant give some quotes to her, so she had a pretty good handle on what was going to need to be done. So that's where those numbers had come from, and that's something that had been discussed with uh, CIAC for a few years, and they opted to originally, you know, move forward with the funding for it. So that it is a safety-related issue. Maybe Sally can provide a little bit more, but I do know I can answer that much. Okay, and, and I guess the other question for Sally would be, is 55000 the full amount? Or again, are we doing small, you know, adding small amounts each year to get to the amount we need to fix the stairs? But knowing it's a safety issue, then I'm more concerned that it wasn't on the list than I... I believe that amount is to do the project. It would cover the cost of construction. Thanks, Derek. Appreciate your help. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I know we had talked about the chiller before, and I know Sally, who I don't believe is on the call tonight, no. um, but we can definitely follow up on that one because um, I do, I don't know if it was her at the, and maybe Tom, you might be able to fill it in at the CIP or um, CIAC meeting uh, about the chiller. There was a, there was not a need this year. I think they could get away with it for the time being, if I'm not mistaken. But we can definitely Under follow. Up. Understood it was lower on the priority list. Right. Yeah, the, the comment was that it could limp along. Um, I don't know if Sally will go on record saying it won't die in the next 12 months, but um, but you it is part of a it is part of a, a two part system, and we did replace one of the parts last year, but in conversations with her before I remove these, it it was felt and I it did come up at the CIP, both mayor and deputy mayor, you're correct, that it was probably on the lower end. Yeah. Um, but we'll get her um, we'll, we'll get her opinion and we can always bring her back or I can get something in from her for deliberations to clarify. Yeah, you, I mean I don't need you don't need to bring her back if if this yep. was a discussion at uh you know that was had and people feel comfortable with putting it off for a year. I just, it seemed to me that it was a constant conversation over the last couple of years. So if, if others are comfortable with holding it off, then that I, you know, I defer to their judgment, to Sally's judgment. Thank you. I think the priority was the other part, which was rusted out on the bottom and leaking into the library was the, uh, the one that was fixed first. This That's one. Correct. Yeah. Yep. This one is uh, still operational and um, unfortunately, you know, we can patch it up for right now and keep it going, but I would like to re revisit it that at some uh, later point, definitely. Okay, any more questions for uh, Derek? Um, My only just, thing just one, Derek. Mike. Oh, I'm sorry, go right ahead, Tom. So uh, Derek, with the traffic sign inventory, is there any penalty or anything that we might incur for not getting uh, inventory completed in a timely manner? Not that I'm aware of. I haven't heard anything. Um, I, off the top of my head, I forget the date, but it was maybe back back in the 90s potentially. So, um, you know, I, to that point, it's not as though we don't replace signs. I know physical services has a staff member specifically designed uh, there for signs. And he does do replacements. Um, I think in talking with him, usually it's just based on age. He knows when most of them were put in. Um, so after a certain amount of years, you can assume that they've faded to the point they need to be replaced. So we have kind of an informal system and they are getting replaced on, on some level. So we do have that to fall back on. Um, but we don't, we, I don't, I don't think we're actually meeting the technical requirement of managing it. And really it's a it's another asset the town has similar to pavement or sidewalks that we, we should be keeping up on. It's a safety uh, concern. It relates to that. So, um, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, I think we'll get, we'll get to it. If it doesn't happen this year, we'll get to it and um, be able to just manage the system better. Is it something that we could put a, uh, you know, write up a formal process, if you will, to at least say that we're, we're working on it, but. We haven't implemented it yet. Uh, we could, we could send something into them. I, I, 
not aware of the town even being contacted by them about it. Um, you know, I suppose if there was an incident and somebody wanted to push that issue, maybe they could they could push the issue that the signs were weren't properly re reflective. Um, so I so we could. I mean, to answer your question, yes, if you, if you maybe just forward, just could. keep it internally. You wouldn't have to send it in just to say, you know, this is what we're working towards, but we're not there yet. And that, and to some extent, that's been documented because it has now gone as an official request through the CIAC. Um, you know, good point. Through, and it's all kind of outlined in the descriptions for it as what the reasoning was. Thanks. I think whether it's uh, FHWA or DEP with our MS4 permitting, they are usually understanding that municipalities are strapped for funds and you do everything to the best of your ability um, based on what's available to you. Okay, thank you. Um, my question was for uh, the closed circuit TV for inspections, drainage inspections. The jump up from eight to 15, you had mentioned, you know, just simply doing more of them. What would that result in? I mean, does that result in we've got more, we find more problems that we don't know about now, or does it result in um, projects that uh, private homeowners would be doing? Usually when we're doing TV inspections, we have a problem with the town system. Um, there are different areas in town where we get severe flooding on heavy rain events, and it seems like the system should be able to take it, and it doesn't. Sometimes uh, we had one last year where we just found the system was chock full of sediment to the point where it basically had no capacity. So that's an easy fix. We just clean it out and it'll work mm -hmm. now. Um, the problem is it's hard to tell from the surface what's going on. So it would generate, it would allow us to identify town systems that have issues that need repair. Sometimes I got physical services do the work if they're available and it's uh, at a level of repair that they can handle. Um, it may come to more ex expensive, costly projects, but that's really on a case by case. The, the reason for the request was in the increase was, as I mentioned, I, I ran out of funds this past year. I had more locations. I just had to scale everything back to, to meet my budget. So there's a need. Um, you know, as I've talked to the town manager about, we'll, we'll utilize whatever we have most efficiently. Um, but that was the reason for the increase. Yes, I cut them last year too. It's a theme. Got it. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Great. Thanks, Derek. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good night. Good night. Good night. Steve? Yes, good evening, everyone. How are you? Doing well. All right, I'm here to present the building department budget. Um, first, I'd like to give a little over, overview on what the building department is. Uh, we work under the guidelines as adopted by the Connecticut State Building Code and operate under provisions of Connecticut General Statute Section 29. We enforce and oversee building code compliance for all buildings, commercial and residential throughout the town. Uh, includes many things, uh, new commercial buildings, new residential buildings, additions, mechanical systems, swimming pools, all kinds of things that require a permit. Um, we oversee. Um, my budget is is pretty basic. Um, like uh, it, it's mostly people, and like other departments, we had an increase in salaries and benefits. Um, the line items as we go down, um, copy and binding, that was removed in error. It was $1,100. That was for um, inspection reports and business cards. Um, we only used half of it, so we could recoup that amount in the general office supply, so I'm not concerned with that. Um, legal advertisements, that's for zoning and, um, and historic district. We advertise in a reminder. Uh, travel training and dues, we're required to get 90 hours of, um, of education every three years as building officials. Um, a lot of the classes have been postponed because of COVID ID, they've been canceled. So there's a majority of that that'll be going back. Um, support services, that's an HDC website. Um, I'm talking now with Kim to see if she could do without and if things work out and she doesn't need it, we could actually give that back also. Um, office machinery is, is pretty self-explanatory. 
Uh, clothing, uh, like, like Derek had mentioned, um, we have safety shoes per union contract. A lot of the stores have been closed. So a lot of that fund is still there. Uh, there'll probably be a little bit in that that we could give back. And then general office supplies and equipment. Um, I'd just like to give you an overview of this year, where we are. <clears throat> Permits uh, for this fiscal year starting July 1st of 2019 to April 30th, we took in a total of 1,688 permits. Um, that's an increase of uh, 164 permits at this time last year. Um, we did 4,018 inspections from July 1st to April 30th. We had an estimated budget revenue of 400,000, and we are, as of July 30th, we're at 399,573. So we'll exceed that amount. So that's, that's pretty much where we are. Um, and if you have any questions. Just real quick on that, 400,000, what was that again? I was writing on the inspections. We're at, yeah, we're, we, yeah, we have an estimate of, of 400,000. We're right at, as of April 30th, we're at 399. And what um, is that for? We've taken a lot of permits, so I'm, I'm sure we're over that. Okay, money in for permits, got it. Yeah. I think it's interesting, you're at 164 permits over last year. We are. And that's COVID, during COVID. Yeah. Yeah, we actually, yeah, the past couple of months have actually, um, permit-wise, have been pretty good. I mean, we've been taking in a lot of permits still. Um, we just took one, we just took a large one in for period and furniture, the, um, the the medical bill, and we took that in a couple weeks ago. So um, we're still active with, with a lot going on. Good. I'll open it up for any questions from anybody. Everybody's good. And no questions from me for the most part. I mean, salaries are what they are. They're holding steady, except for just a, a couple, you know, here and there. They're going up. Mm -hmm. uh, my, uh, no, my only thing is the majority, as you said, most of that stuff is going back. And that, that may be another question. I, I did think about this um, talking to somebody the other day about the, um, training seminars and workshops that folks uh, should be going to. And uh, it's actually somebody from a convention bureau I talked to and they said their, their money is drying up because people aren't going to the requisite um, workshops and, um, you know, furthering their education. So Gary, we may actually see some, you know, recouping across the board in all the departments where you know, there, there's some education courses that are required that they couldn't make for 2020 that they would have to go to, unless they do it in the fall. Um, but if they do it sometime in the uh, next year, we could just transfer that savings over. It's not a lot. I mean, for, for building departments, only, you know, maybe four, yeah, 3,900. So if it's half of that, maybe we can get $2,000 or something. It's just, you know, looking at anywhere we can, I'm not trying to nick, nickel and dime, but you know, if, if we can across the, the departments, find some savings when it comes to, you know, clothing, like Steve said, you know, I think he's the first one to mention that, you know, some of those that they could reuse some of the clothing, all good ways to save. Yeah, the with clothing, it, it is in their contract. So depending upon what, the condition is and whether or not there that's a tough one are you talking about using this this year's funds for next year this year's um education funds you know like seminars and workshops and, and training yeah the, the only thing to remember is though i don't think it carries over you know it's one of those things that you look that it falls to either fund balance or into um into res, um reserves yeah um, you know, the thing to consider, well, next year, will you see more online training make, made available? And for some of these, it's it, their requirements, building departments requirement, fire marshals required. Um, are they required to get those CO, CEUs? And to your point, those industry leaders that provide those are probably going to evolve um, so you can still meet the mandated requirements. So I would just, I would caution yeah. us as a group to consider, um, you know, for those that are mandatory, um, right you might want to keep those in just because they could turn around and say you can do it online. 
I am, yes, yes. We would definitely keep those in. I'm just looking, like you said, fund balance, where we could put that. I agree, yeah. When, whenever possible, we want to try to. Spend down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, no questions. I good about the, um, I, you know, this is a budget workshop, so I don't want to get too into the, the on projects, but it was good to hear about um, Puritan. Uh, yeah. I'm looking at the work that's being done on the Charles uh, restaurant, and you know, you know, if everything goes as planned with May 20th and possibly June 20th and stage one, two, three, and four, we should start to see some buildings uh, like the Charles uh, open up in yeah. restaurants. Yeah, yeah. The the one I think P and Z had it at last Tuesday's meeting though. Um, the Maple Street, 24 Maple Street LLC, the uh, burger supply, oh, yeah. or you know, yeah. restaurant supply, but the uh, uh, ABC burger, they're suspending. Are we going to see that for a while, or when do they believe they're going to start going back up again? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I, hadn't, I hadn't spoken to anybody about that. I'm not sure where that is. Um, I could definitely reach out to, to the owner and talk to him to see where that is. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where he is with that. Okay, I know Peter's coming up next. Yeah, he'd be the yeah he'd be the one to ask that. Yeah. Did they give a year extension? Is that what it was? What's that? Did What's they that? give him a one year extension to start? Um, I'm, as far as P and Z goes, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure where that is. Yeah, uh, yeah Peter would be probably better. Peter. Peter Glass. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Well, we could definitely. We'll see some of those permits and, um, you know, if we can keep that momentum going despite this little, uh, well, not little, but hopefully it's a short term and in the construction in the building phase of COVID that, you know, we might be able to see some actual building starting back up again in uh, um, the summertime. Yeah, right. That'd be great. Yeah. Well, like I said, we're still busy. We have a lot of commercial yeah. jobs going on on that end. So, and then, and there's still a lot of residential jobs. We've seen a we we've seen a lot of swimming pools come in, central air conditioners. So I think people are the trend is I think people are figuring they're going to stay home. So we're we're seeing an uptick in swimming pools and air and central air conditioners and, and things like that. So um, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yep. People adapt. Okay. Yep, we do. Yeah. Anybody else? Good. Okay. Thanks, okay, Steve. Guys. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks, Steve. Okay. I did see Mark and Peter jumped on. How are you guys? Good evening. How are you? Doing well. I also think have Chris Trazek, the chair of the uh, Heritage Tourism Commission, joining us as well. I'm, I think I saw her name. There, there she is. There she comes. Hey, Chris, how are you? I think we need okay. to unmute her. So thanks for having me, uh, Mr. Mayor, town councilors. Um, just I'll start off with a quick overview of our department. Uh, our department consists of two staff person, myself and Denise Bradley, the assistant planner. So we're a small, small group in the planning office. Uh, we support a, a wide range of boards and commissions, primarily, as you just discussed, the Planning and Zoning Commission. We also support the Economic Development Commission, the Redevelopment Agency, um, the Design Review Advisory Committee, and the Heritage Tourism Commission. Additionally, over the last year or two, we've had a couple of additional responsibilities added to us. Uh, we now have a Bike and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, which we're working with. Uh, we also have a Parking Study Committee for Old Weathersfield. And then recently, uh, I was asked to uh, coordinate our sustainable Connecticut designation. So we're working on that this year with, uh, with the hopes that at the end of the year, we can submit that designation for the community. Um, our main responsibilities are to coordinate the development review process here in town. Uh, we also administer a number of economic development programs, uh, incentives, um, and we also handle a number of grant programs and then special projects. So that quickly summarizes uh, what we do uh, in the planning uh, office. In terms of our budget, um, looking at the numbers, there's a slight increase. I think the increase is 3.4%. Uh, all of that increase is 
uh, a result of the increase in uh, employee benefits. I think it's about a $13,000 increase. So almost exclusively that increase uh, is because of those benefits. Uh, at this point in our budget year, uh, we've spent about 80% of our budget. So we're on target uh, to spend uh, our budget. There are a few items that I think as a result of uh, COVID that we might be able to give back at the end of the year. Um, so we can certainly talk about those uh, opportunities if you'd like, but um, that in a, in a Reader's Digest version is, is what we do and what our budget is all about this year. I'd be happy to answer any questions or respond to some of the questions you had with some of the other earlier sessions. Anybody else or anybody with questions at all? Tom? So, uh, Peter, the, one of the items that doesn't look like has been uh, utilized too much is the professional services. Yes. Looks like there's 10, 10 grand still in that account. So that, that item that we, yeah, that item that we have not spent yet is our uh, brochure uh, rack card display. We have a contract with CTM Media. They uh, deliver promotional material for historic Weathersfield at all the visitor centers, all of the hotels, all of the restaurants. Uh, we normally contract for that around this time of year. We're probably going to skip a few months um, and not do the full contract. So there may be a few thousand dollars in savings. Uh, hopefully uh, all of those destinations will open up at some point over the summer and certainly into the fall. So we would still do the program, but we might be able to save uh, money related to a few months of that uh, contract. So we contract for about seven months out of each year. Um, we usually start in May. Um, so we obviously have not contracted yet. So probably at least May and June, uh, we can realize some savings. Is that, is that about it for the savings? For the no, there's a couple of other things that um, I think at the end of the year, we might be able to um, give back. Um, the National Planning Conference we had budgeted for, uh, which, which just passed, they did that virtually. Uh, that line item is about $2,500, uh, I think, uh, they did it virtually. I think it only cost us maybe $300. So there's some significant savings there. Uh, we had a, a breakfast meeting budgeted. Uh, we did a breakfast meeting earlier uh, or later last year for the CPACE program. Uh, we were planning on paying for that. The CPACE program paid for that. So that's a $1,500 savings probably. And then there are some tourism ads that we have not done yet and we might not do. So there are probably a few thousand dollars there as well. So totaling it all up, we're probably talking uh, $4,500 potentially uh, in savings there with all three of those. Thank you. Sure. Matt, did I see your hand up earlier? Uh, yes, please. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mark, Chris, Peter, good to see you all. It's been you a too, few man. months. Uh, yes. but we had a great time, you know, doing what we had, what we were doing a couple, uh, you know, last year, but that said, can, um, I guess looking positively toward the future, we just got a nice report from, uh, our building inspectors and the engineering that buildings is up even from last year, even through this process. And although a lot of the permits of course are smaller, uh, improvements to our sort of personal residences. I wanted to see how we could support, continue to support you as it relates to some of the larger product projects. Obviously we have a couple coming online soon, hopefully Artesian Burger, et cetera. But when it comes to the corner of Wells and Celestine Highway, uh, we all see the signs outside and so on and so forth. I know there are some small funds that have been sort of put aside, but uh, as we move into this budget, how can we continue to support larger scale development to help offset some of the uh, the misbalance between our commercial and residential real estate tax burden. So the big opportunity that is out there is obviously the Jordan Lane uh, nursing home, the former nursing home there. Uh, we are in conversation with that owner. Um, it, it is it is not a, uh, it, he's an owner who owns multiple, multiple properties uh, across <laughs> the East Coast. I, I think uh, this project is not on his radar screen. Uh, we may need to 
uh, either partner or incentivize something happening with that property. Uh, it's probably not um, a line item in my budget that we would, um, you know, use to support that project. But I think uh, we need to have a broader conversation about how we can um, uh, get that property back on the tax rolls. But I think it's going to take us becoming a partner with him to a certain extent. We have talked to him about taking advantage of some of the state programs, but uh, we have not been able to get him to move in that um, in that direction. So I see that that project as well as 1000 Silestine Highway, which is the uh, former Weight Watchers, uh, as another opportunity to partner with that property owner in order to make something happen. Both of them um, have not been um, terribly motivated to do anything with their properties and we may have to uh, be at the table in order for that to happen. The details of that, um, I, uh, probably not the forum to get into, but uh, yeah. it is probably a conversation we need to have um, sooner than later. So the question is not so much, we don't, we, every month we went through, continue to go through the litany of how we're working with these various pro, uh, properties. It's not, I don't think what this particular conversation is about, is about, but this particular conversation is about as you, as how do we put our best foot forward? How do we continue to, from a budgetary standpoint, do we need to be allocating resources, reallocating resources, changing resource allocations, prioritizing, et cetera, through this budgetary process to present you guys with the tools to be successful for our town. And and I think that's from a budgetary standpoint, like what it's fair to it's fair to tie in budgetary and tools that we're talking about now into a project. Here's what we plan to do with it. But is there anything in the budget that we need to adjust, could adjust, you know, to make your lives uh, more successful, your your success? Matt, well, thank you for trying to make me more successful. People have been trying to do that for a long time. Um, I think the, um, the, the, it's a great question. I think one of the tools that you always need between EDIC and RDA, uh, on top of the uh, personal capital we've got with the people that are involved with those commissions, uh, which is very, very good, is the is some is spending power, investment power, um, but it's almost a chicken or the egg type of thing. I think the issue that we have is that the facilities that we have need it. So I know yes. Peter's had very good conversations with them. It's getting the owners of the properties and the developers of the properties to um, to step forward and want to be committed whether we had a massive tech book or not, not sure if that really would um, add that much to the party um, at this point, because we just don't have people as motivated as we'd like them to be. Um, it's not for not trying. I think we've investigated and, and the town manager has done a, a, a pretty exhaustive search along with you with regards to blight issues that we could potentially put out there to help maybe animate uh, the owners of these properties to come forward a little bit. But I also think the economic structure or the economic impact, I should say, that the um, this pandemic has had on these owners of the properties may either make them more reasonable to talk to. I don't know. I haven't, we, I don't know if we've been, the last time we've been in touch with them, Peter, um, I don't know if it's been within the last couple of months, but it could be, it could motivate them to come to the table potentially. I don't know what type of financial issues these particular developers have. But you're right, um, at one point, I think we're gonna have an opportunity to hit pay dirt and it probably will require capitalization potentially from the town. Uh, but we, we don't have a project yet to present you. So like I said, chicken or the egg. I think having the capital at one point or trying to or be thinking about where that could possibly be and help would be a very satisfying item for us to know that we have capital that we could use to motivate. Uh, but at this point, even if we have the capital, we just don't have, again, developers uh, uh, that are willing to sit down with us or that motivated. Now that being said, I actually see this evolution that's going on out there. I mean, granted, we have to get through some heartache for a while, but the reality is you're going to see a reinvention of how people view their ability to work. So before the idea of working from home and being able to work remotely was only for a small percentage of the workforce, it seems to have grown a little bit larger. So you have to reconsider the fact that the people you can target to relocate to a Wethersfield 
might be those people who formerly needed to be closer to major metropolitan hubs. Um, now they only need to commute in maybe once or twice a week and they could work remotely. So access to rail, access to public transportation, or major routes such as 91, 84, Route 2, Route 3, um, and the Mass Pike, you might have an opportunity to capture a market you might not have gotten before. You've got to get through some stuff first, but I think the best thing from an economic development standpoint is to position yourself to capture those individuals. Um, you know, access to a fiber optic network, for example, which we have. Um, all of those things are kind of part and partial to where we need to look for the future. And I think to Mark's point is there, there's probably that opportunity for a public-private partnership down the road. And we, we want to try to begin to position ourselves, um, you know, with only 8% 8, 8 of our tax base being from the commercial structure, we have to figure out how we capitalize on revenue sources in other ways. Probably two cents. Agreed. Okay. So it doesn't sound like the, there's nothing else that you guys are looking for in the budget in order to help push things forward. And, and it is there, what it is. is that yeah. Accurate? I mean, there are, there are some things that we, we can, but probably not this early in the, in the budget stage. Okay. Thanks a lot. Unless Peter had something that he really no, I think the, the budget as submitted is, um, you know, we'll, we'll stand pat on that. I think it's uh, adequate for our purposes at this point in time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, and we, we've had a lot of conversations prior to, uh, you know, COVID in, in mid-March. <laughs> we saw where we were going and I kind of wanted to continue in that direction where, uh, you, know, you know, Peter, Mark, Gary, and I sat down and we met and we had a pretty good conversation going. Um, hopefully things will turn around quickly for us and, you know, we can start to, uh, to market some of those. It's amazing so, how a pandemic really just ruins your plan. Yeah. Yep. Um, However, given the, the crisis, we're still getting the phone calls and getting the inquiries. So uh, things have slowed down a little bit, but not um, not absolutely quiet. So um, there's still interested parties out there. Good. That's great. Um, I there was, just there had was a one question. question. About the, there was a question about the, sorry about that. There was a question about ABC Burger. He did uh, request and was granted a one year uh, extension to start the project. Um, he's not likely to start it this year, given the, the issues that we're all facing, but he's uh, certainly committed to the project and uh, was given a one year. Uh, he, we have a requirement that you start uh, a permit within a year from the planning and zoning approval. So he just wanted mm -hmm. to make sure he maintained that. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else with any questions at all? I just had one. Uh, legal expenses, legal advertisement. Uh, 1718, it went up about $1,600. Stayed about the same, only decreased about 600. Now you're decreasing it again, about 600. Uh, we are required to put in advertisement of public notices in Hartford Current and any. We have now switched to the rare reminder. Um, it meets the statutory obligation. Uh, we had issues in the past uh, with their deadlines. They've agreed to be a little more flexible. Uh, we have, a, we have um, uh, more frequent uh, legal notice requirements than some of the other boards mm -hmm. and commissions. So we um, were able to work that out with them and we've just started the process of switching over to the rare reminder. So we should realize those savings next year by doing that. We were having uh, multiple issues with the Hartford Current. Um, so we finally made that decision. Okay. My Hartford Current didn't get delivered until about 11.30 yesterday, so I'm having multiple problems with the Hartford Current as well. So. When, you, when you want to talk to the Hartford Current and you end up talking to somebody in Chicago, it, it puts it in perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was reading Monday's news and yesterday's current. So, um, Good. Anybody else, anything? Okay, thank you. Thank you and have a good night. Chris, thank, thank you. you. Mark, thank You're you. You're welcome. Thanks. Thank you guys. Okay, I did see, yep.
Marjorie and Fauna. Was Fauna on as well? Yep, Fauna, I see you guys. How are you? Good evening. Hello. Thanks, for <laughs> Thanks for saying. We can go tax collector first, please. Sure. Um, basically, the not too much changes. Um, the Employees are contractual and it's only the technical assistant and the part-timers has increased um, a little bit. And the other items were all, finance gives us those numbers. The most difference that I have is on copy and binding and that's the amount to print the tax bills. Um, I get my quote from the provider who prints the bills for us. It pretty much, some of the things stay the same, like the book binding doesn't really change, that stays the same. Just the cost goes up slightly for the paper and the envelopes and all that to print the bills. Um, there'll be a savings this year, myself was included where conferences are because our conference was canceled. It was supposed to be right around the time COVID came out this year. So there'll be a savings there. Um, there's a, the web hosting, QDS support and web hosting. That's so that we can have the online system so the taxpayers can do research or they can pay their bills. And then there's data processing services. We pay for, um, Accurate, that's under IT equipment. Um, that's the program we use to find residents. We have a pretty high turnaround with that. It's very effective in finding people. We actually help other departments when they need help looking for people as well. And the office supplies stayed the same. That's pretty much just um, toner and the receipts we use at the register to give the customers and the ribbons for the validators at the registers as well. And that's Pretty much it. Any yeah. questions? Anybody have any questions? Okay. No. No, I'm, I don't have it. I mean, it's built right in. Healthcare and pension costs. That's it. Everything else is in step. So. And web hosting. It's just typical. You know, they're just increasing their their fee yeah right yep. yep okay good nothing else from anybody okay thank you thank you have a good night don't get used to this next year <laughs> when we're not doing this you're all staying at the uh fireside room until nine ten o'clock with us so. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Fauna. Good night. Hi, how are you guys? I hope you can hear me. Yep. yep. Oh, good, because I had trouble with this laptop and other meetings. So, um, uh, the majority of our budget is changed is just due to our contractual ob obligations with salaries, pension, health care. Um, mm -hmm. Most of our other line items are the same. Um, the only thing that we increased was professional services, and that's just an allocation for the audit program that we're doing with TMA. And um, am I there? Oh, my audio. Here you you just... There it is. There it is. Um, um, other than that, that is, that is it. Do you guys have anything in specific you want to know about? I'm good. Anybody else? Oh, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Uh, could, could, Bonnie, could you just go over briefly, kind of the uh, what, uh, what the that increase in the property audit, like what, what, what does that entail? So we, um, we have we currently are doing two audit programs. One, we hire an individual auditor. We pay him $5,000 a year, and he audits accounts that we pick. Um, last year, we did CNG, and we got quite a high payout on that. Um, but that is just a strict amount of audits that we choose. Um, the other program is, is we're using TMA, and they're auditing all accounts over a certain value, um, which I think, I think was about 50000 
in that program, uh, we had done a third and they're now going through the other, the other uh, two thirds for this year. So what they do is they audit the personal property counts. They look at their books. They look at what they have there. And if they've been declaring fine, there's no, there's no change. Um, but if they've under been under declaring based on their books and what they have at the property, then they would have an audit result that would increase their back years that they did not declare for properly. And in these programs, are they best practices? Are they like mandated? Um, is that, has the town always done them? Um, we've always done the $5,000 to the auditor. Um, TMA is a new program that we picked up. Uh, it's contingency based though. Um, if they don't find anything, we don't, we don't have to pay them anything. Yeah. So we only pay on what we've received. So we're not out of pocket for this. We're only paying a portion of the money that we've collected. Okay. Thank you very and, much. Yeah, and we only pay if they pay, or they, we only pay TMA if that person pays. If that person goes out of business, for some, for some reason they don't pay us, um, we do not have to pay them for that audit. Thank you. So if I understand correctly, the higher the number, the more money we've gotten well, yeah, because it's a percentage. It's 25% of the collected amount. And it's, it's working so far? I mean, it's... Yeah, it's working so far. Um, it'll be a little harder this year with COVID going on. Um, some people are okay with it. Some people are not. So they're working with those situations and where some people are thinking it's a great time. I, you know, I got a little free time. Some people are like, no, not don't do it right now. But... Um, so they're working with them. Mm -hmm. We'll see how it all plays out. You know, we just don't know yet. The other thing is we're always, um, we're always looking for the next reval and in, in CNEF we put money aside for, uh, for a, a portion for reval, which will be what, 2023? Yep. Yep. Already again. <laughs> put a little aside each budget year. So it's not just one large, um, Ass. assessment when it hits yeah yep. I saw Mary you had a question oh I was just going to ask about um in the, like the year-to-date budget report we got that's dated um April 23rd it looks like your professional services you spent almost double what was budgeted is that related to the program you were just talking to or yeah that's the audit program that's the audit program budget so you, how did you end up spending twice as much as what was budgeted? And well, that's what we're estimating that we might pay out based on results that we get from TMA. So this isn't money you already spent and this? No. No, that's what we're hoping, you know, that, and that's probably low, um, but it's just an estimation at this point in time. Okay. Mary, you're looking at the actual 20 numbers, right? This is Mike O'Neill. Yeah, I'm looking at, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we found, we, we paid TMA this year. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't budget it. We instituted the program after the budget was adopted last year. Okay. And we decided, I mean, you could, some places, you know, finance director might decide to just net the fees into the revenue. I just didn't think that was a good way to do it. So we decided to, to put it in Fauna's expenditures for this year. It was going to put her over, but you know, this is, it. this, this program pays for itself many times over. So we, we didn't, we didn't let the bookkeeping hold us up on that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just, uh, and, and so the money that you get it back in return because the valuations will be going up and you'll be able to collect more and that, yeah, so it offsets. That's fine. I was just, it, it just really stood out, stood out. So yeah, the yeah, audit that, line, that yeah. line's going to be over this year. Yeah, it'll be over. And the audit, the audit program will look back three years. So it's not, it's not just going forward. It looks back three years, see if it matches. What doesn't match, we end up billing out and we collect on. We also do get a gain going forward because we've then found the assets or instructed them how to properly declare, and we do get it in the future but we're also collecting from the past three years. Okay. Thanks. 
Not them. Gotcha. Good. Tom? No, that's what I was asking. So it's all set. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I just had a question. I should have probably asked Steve as well. Um, and you talked about it when you go and do inspections and, you know, when we were talking about reval and all that. For any inspections, are you and staff doing it remotely uh, via, you know, like FaceTime with somebody, photos, or because I know I believe one of the executive orders had said that, you know, if you can't go in or you don't feel like you mm -hmm. go in, the public does not have to, you know, allow you well, to. That's always the case. The public always has not been able to let us in if they don't feel like it. Um, and oftentimes, that is the case. Um, so uh, for, for us, we're not currently really doing inspections right now. There's no need for us to do it. But as October 1st gets closer, we're going to have to figure out what we're, what we're going to do at that point in time uh, mm -hmm. to see how we're going to address it with the taxpayers. I like to try to do is, you know, if they want to call us or we can email. Um, we have use of aerial imagery. I think they just put some on sometimes with Google Maps. We're able to, to do things, um, but as that gets closer, we'll see what we're going to be able to do or not not do. The majority of our, our ground list growth has nothing to do with going inside a house. Right. A lot right. of it's just outside or, you know, or if the people are on cooperative, we add it anyways. It's the only thing, you know, otherwise we would never get anywhere. But You'd never so ever. We're pretty good at trying to make do with what we got. I don't think COVID is going to be a, a huge deal for us. Okay. Just, and Mayor, to that point, um, I, I can tell you that Steve is doing a combination of inspections. So depending upon what it is, sometimes they're actually physically out there on site using uh, social distancing, correct PPEs. Um, others, they are using remote um, video cameras, Duo, Google Duo. Um, it all depends upon the severity of what the permit is and the level of safety hazard related to it. Um, so they, they do have a combination, but they have been going out on site, but, um, you know, they're limited to what they can and can't do remotely. So it's important for them in order to close the CO and move on. Mm -hmm. uh, they are going out there and physically inspecting in some cases. And again, this is all part of the plan for uh, or the discussions for both internal and external external operations going forward, which we're trying to put together. Right. Okay. Nobody else? Good. Okay. Thank you both. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Good night. Good night. Take care. Good night. John's been here since the get-go. Where are you, John? There you are. Hang on, you gotta unmute yourself. I got him. There we go. Now Thanks. can you hear me? Yep. Good evening, this is my first opportunity to meet many of you. Um, I wish it were under better circumstances, but uh, we'll do what we have to do. Um, the, the town operates a Harris P25 trunked simulcast phase two land mobile radio system. It's a lot of words that need a lot of explanation, and I'll, I'll try to do a little bit of that. Um, P25 is a standard. It's a, it's a digital standard that was adopted back in the uh, early 90s. It's a digital standard for interoperable systems, so a P25 system is able to operate, interoperate with other manufacturers. Uh, Motorola is uh, obviously the big one in the system. Harris is number two in this country. Trunked means that we don't use dedicated channels. We have six channels which are assigned by, uh, by one of them. One of them is the control channel. When somebody hits the push to talk within a quarter of a second, that radio sends a signal to the controller on the control channel and the controller says, all right, everybody on PD1 talk group, go to channel three. And when somebody else speaks, it's done all over again, all within a, a, a fraction of a second. So it, it's efficiency 
of frequencies. It, it allows us to use far more, get far more radio traffic on fewer frequencies. That's what trunking does. Um, I did mention that we have six channels, uh, one control and five bearer channels. We have a phase two system. What phase two means is that each of those 10 bearer channels is split in half. So because it's digital, not analog, uh, we can transmit two conversations over one channel. So that gives us essentially 10 talk paths, the ability to have far more users on our system than we need. But um, th this system was designed and built for the future. Uh, unlike the previous system, which was obsolete within a couple of years, um, hope hopefully this system will be with the town for a good 25 years. Uh, we have three sites, three transmit and receive sites, one at Kelleher Court, one at Callahan Mountain, which is just over Lyon in Newington, and the third one is on top of Executive Square. There are no transmit and receive facilities at the police department. There is a tower there uh, that's mainly used for, for cell providers. Um, we do have, obviously, our dispatch center at the PD, but there are no transmit and receive uh, equipment at, in that shelter. What we do have in that shelter is a backup control center. The primary control center is at Kelleher in that shelter, but we have a backup one. The system is built with plenty of redundancies. Um, another redundancy we have in the system design is that we use the town's fiber optic network for backhaul. That's to connect all the sites and transmit back and forth. We have a fail back, a fallback position for that. We use, have microwaves that are in standby position. In fact, this Thursday, the town is undergoing a, um, an upgrade to our fiber optic network, which will force sites off the network at various points in time as we go around and replace hardware. We will be falling over to the uh, microwave backup for, for transport uh, during that time. We've done this before, we've tested it, um, we've had experiences where we've fallen over to it, and it's seamless. There's, there's no perceptible uh, interruption to anybody. Um, subscribers, we have about 400 subscriber radios on the system. There are 15 control stations. Uh, those are the three dispatch positions, and those are about a dozen other what we call bases, uh, was one in the town garage, there's two in town hall, um, there's, uh, or, or, or there's one in each firehouse. So there's uh, the 15 control stations, there's 137 mobile devices, those are in vehicles, trucks, fire trucks, police cars, town vehicles. We have 240 portable users um, of which 155 are this XL200 type radio, and about 82 are an older model. I don't know if you can perceive the difference, but this is an XG25, and I'll get into the differences between those two and what's happening with that older radio in a few minutes. And the last eight users we have subscribed to our system are classified as other. We have a few um, Kenwood radios, again, interoperable, that the town of uh, Rocky Hill uses that are registered to our system. Some of our maintenance staff that, that are hired by uh, Harris are registered to the system. So that's a total of about 400 subscriber units. I purchase out of my budget about six to eight uh, to 10 radios a year as replacements and up upgrades. Um, the system itself, the Harris proposal was submitted in July of 2013. Uh, it was designed and built in the summer and fall of 2014, installed in November and December of 2014. It was cut over January 6, 2015. So it's just over five years in operation. It was not accepted. Many of you, or those of you who have been around will, will remember this. I think I was the only one. What, pardon Wait. me? Mike, you're the only one? I don't know, Amy, were you on the council in 15 when? We were holding yeah. off on them. Um, it, it was not accepted until 2017, April 18th of 2017, about two and a quarter years after the initial installation. Uh, we had a lot of problems to deal with over the implementation 
period. Um, and, and I've got to say that Harris stepped up. They worked hard. The town manager at the time worked them very hard. Uh, they delivered. The system was finally uh, accepted. And the warranty coverage started running on April 18th of 2017. Um, as far as my budget is concerned, most of, most of the maintenance costs that are involved in there go to system monitoring, paper system monitoring, uh, software upgrades, uh, component replacement and repair services, not the hardware, but the, the um, services to do that work. It does not cover end user equipment. Those, the, the warranty period for those ran out after a year. So if a radio breaks down, I send it back to the factory in four to six weeks, I'll get it back later. And for that reason, we try to keep a, an inventory of spare units. We've got six spares in fire, we had about, we had four spares in police. Uh, we just got four new in a, about a month ago that I'm gonna be programming and putting online so, soon. The, the industry, and, and I also acquired two, uh, no, four mobile units recently. We're down to one or two mobiles as replacements or spares. Uh, the inventory standard is 10 to 15% of your inventory for spare inventory we're carrying about two to three. So that's why over the past few years, I've been trying to buy, you know, half a dozen uh, spare units a year. Um, last year I did begin and it showed up. Uh, it was a, this, this radio that the public safety, the police and fire uses, the XL200 is a replacement. This was part of the negotiations and took a long time for um, the acceptance. The initial radio that the public safety users were issued was the XG25, and it had its problems. The XL200 is a far superior unit. Um, it, it came about about three, three and a half years ago. We were one of the first in the country to use it. We beta tested it for Harris, but it is now the standard. They stopped manufacturing the XG75. The XG25, which is the unit that's used by our parks and rec people, our public uh, physical services people, um, building department, uh, engineering. We've got about 80 of these units, as I said. Those will be discontinued sometime in the future. So uh, being aware of that, last year I asked Mike O'Neill uh, if I could budget 10 a year over eight years to replace these units with the newer XL185 version, and this is that radio. Um, if I could get 10 a year over the next 10 years and start to beat them to the punch before they end of life, the other one, and if three years down the road we were forced to replace this unit with a better one, um, then we, at least we had a jump on it. Uh, it got cut last year a little bit. I did get six, and, and this is in fact one of those six that were purchased, the, the, the replacements for the lower grade portables. This one is intended to go to uh, EMS. Um, six of these did come in a, a, about a month and a half ago. I programmed them out. I programmed them up, got, got them ready to issue. And the day before we issued them, uh, Karen Tomczyk, who's the deputy EMD director and the chief dispatcher for the town, and I just discussed it. We said, look, let's hold those six in bay in a, in a charging rack in police in case there's an emergency given the COVID crisis that we needed them. Um, so they sat around for about a month in Iraq and within the last couple of days we said, all right, let's, let's get them out now. You know, we haven't had to use them. I did get six, four more upgrades in as replacements or spares so we can get these, start to distribute these. So that's the XL185, which is a replacement for the XG25. Um, Looking at the budget page now, uh, most, most everything is about the same year to year. Um, I have had money in for training. Uh, it was $5,000 two or three years ago, but each of the last couple of years I've, I've increased that, hoping to find a replacement for me. I'm not a town employee. I'm a, a, a contract consultant, a 1099 employee. I work about 20 hours a week, although I've been working a little bit more lately. Um, but I put 
extra money in there in the last couple of years to try to find a replacement. And I actually did have somebody, I had a fish on the hook about three months ago, started to reel them in. Uh, and the day before I was going to introduce them to the IT team and to Mike and start to get their feeling for whether he was going to be acceptable, uh, he bailed on me. He said he was moving out of state. It, it, was, it was actually my former boss, the retired chief information officer for the city of Hartford. And, uh, he was, he was willing to do it, but then decided at the last minute to move. So that's what the training money is in there, is to try to get somebody trained up if I can find a replacement. Um, my, my services are in the next line, the uh, consultant. There is a $5,000 amount for TROT communications. We, we lowered that a little bit. We use TROT. They're a consulting firm out of uh, Oklahoma, mostly for FCC licensing work, um, you know, they, they file the papers and do a renewal license. They also are available on call for uh, highly technical RF requests, and I, I call on them occasionally. Uh, the Harris maintenance contract, we have a sliding scale that was issued in as an addendum to the contract uh, is a 15-year uh, schedule for uh, the general maintenance. And again, I said that $183,000 pays for us to get a, a, an engineer uh, from Harris to come in once a week or more if necessary, um, whenever we need it. He does monitor the system. He checks in every day remotely. Um, we speak every, just about every day. Um, if, if there are, uh, several of us in, in town do get emails of emergency alerts or alarms if components uh, go wacky, uh, you know, they'll, sometimes fail or sometimes go into a weird state. I'll call Randy whenever I need to and, and he'll hop on it or he'll, he'll uh, he's, he's available. But that $183,000 pays for those services and the maintenance of the system, um, software upgrades. Uh, he does uh, routine software patches to all the components of, this, of the system. There's a, um, the, the sums maintenance that you see in there was rolled into the Harris maintenance co contract uh, in the past years. And we just pulled that out just to show a different, different uh, view of it. Sums is software user manage or, or you know, software update management service. That's one of the services uh, that they provide. There is a new line for structural engineering. We put $3,000 in there. Um, We've had a couple issues in the last few years. Uh, I work with uh, Anthony Arborio in the building department. Whenever somebody on one of the two town-owned cell towers, uh, whenever one of the cell providers wants to make a change, if they add an, or swap antennas, um, add equipment, there's a whole procedure for uh, Connecticut State Siting Council approval and building approval. They need a building permit. Um, one of the key components of that process is to get a structural engineering analysis of the tower. We want to know what the weight load is on that tower and how it changed even minimally. Um, generally in the past we've relied on an applicant to provide a, um, an engineer, or we, we, we actually required that an applicant uh, provide an engineering analysis. Uh, Anthony and I, or Bar Arborio and, and, and uh, Steve Larule and I have discussed this and said we probably ought to have an independent one done once a year on our two towers. And that's about $1,500 per site. So that's what that $3,000 new item is in there. Um, the rest of the stuff is uh, pretty much the same. Uh, support services for electricity. Um, CMED contribution is gone. That's, that's a zero. But the, the stuff under that is rental. We, we rent uh, the Callahan site, we rent the Executive Square site. Uh, Executive Square costs us far less than Callahan's does. Um, as far as the uh, specialized supplies and equipment, um, you'll see four of the XL200s, the first line item there. You'll see miscellaneous uh, tower site and board components. I'm trying to buy a few critical component each year so that we have them for hot swappable, um, a, a, a transmit unit, a receive unit on the, on the base stations. Um, 
a Cisco data switch. You know, it's it's a lot of um, off the shelf type of uh, of electronic components. So I'm trying to buy stuff that I don't have. You know, Harris has a, a one day turnaround, but if we don't have it in stock, sometimes we'll lose a channel or a site. So I'm trying to get a few pieces, uh, and that's what that tower site boards and components is. Uh, put in for two more uh, police mobiles in the next year. Um, the other, there's another new thing in there. We'll we'll talk about it in a minute um, in, or in a couple minutes. But uh, last year, Mike O'Neill asked me to put together a five-year capital plan for radio systems improvements or maintenance. I did them one better. I made an eight-year plan, um, and one of those plans was to replace the. Uh, the XG25s over over 10 years or over eight years. Um, and that started in the current year. Next year in my eight year plan, I had asked to uh, start to replace the HVAC units in each of the radio shelters. We own two, we have two um, that we rent, but we still pay for the maintenance of that uh, HVAC shelter. Yeah, this is the, the capital plan. Uh, and you can see in the um, uh, in the second column, the 2021 uh, kicks in the shelter replacements. So what I wanted to do, each, each shelter has two HVAC units, a primary and a backup, and sometimes they both operate when it's very hot or a very cold day. They both kick in. They both heat and cool their heat pumps. Um, We've had some issues with breakdowns over the past few years. Uh, the town, uh, town garage staff, uh, the mechanical maintenance folks asked me to put, do something about that. They said, you know, these are 20 year old HVAC units. They don't last forever. So the plan was developed. We'll take two a year over the next four years and replace one of each other over the next four years. So that, that's what that $12,500 New item is that that's in that line. Uh, I've, I've asked to replace some batteries. You know, we we use lithium ion batteries in these units. Uh, they pop out fairly easily. So those are the batteries, and and they last a couple of years. So we we uh, we I think I bought a twenty five this year. I, probably going to need to buy 50 next year. Uh, and then finally, other miscellaneous supplies. I have to replace speaker mics uh, for the police officers. Those break down. Uh, fire has a specialized speaker mic. We, we have uh, headsets for the fire pump operators and ladder operators so they can operate away from uh, the cab, still use their portable, and hear what's going on over the news. So we have speakers for, for them, uh, headsets with with a microphone attachment for them, uh, antennas, um, all kinds of other supplies. That's what the last item is. Two of the items that I did request were pulled out of here and put into um, CNEF. Um, and well, we'll get to the, I guess we can get to those. So, you know, when we get to the CNEF. Oh, well, Mike's got it there, but you'll see um, the portable radio replacements. Uh, I had asked for $25,000 to buy these, you know, uh, six or eight or more of these, and that was cut to 10. So I think, or I think it was 25 for, yes, yeah, 25 for 10 again. Uh, so I'll probably be able to buy four this year if I get that 12, if I get that $10,000. Uh, and the other item was. Oh, I guess the radio sh kept the upgrade. Yeah, what was that that was moved, Mike? Um, HVAC upgrades, those who moved into CNEF. They appear in both places or not?
Oh, there we go. Sorry. It, yeah, it looks like the HVAC. Uh, that shouldn't say HVAC, John. It's just that that's the UPS upgrade. That's oh, UPS. that's the UPS. Yeah. You're right. Sorry about that. Right. Ignore the, we, ignore we, the we also budget for uh, we have UPS units in each of the four shelters. We we budget for batteries to replace one shelter's worth of of uh, batteries each year. They last about five years, and and the the largest UPS we do in a split over two years. So over a five year cycle, we replace four years worth of batteries. About two years ago, they announced that the UPSs were end of life. The police department replaced their U similar UPSs with new ones over the last year. So I want to replace the shelter UPSs with the same model that was used in the PD. Um, again, one a year over four years, and we'll stagger those. And as long as they still operate, we're in good shape. Um, if they kick, you know, if they, if they go out of service uh, and they've been end of life, then we're in trouble, but uh, we've got enough to maneuver here so that we'll figure out what we have to sacrifice if we have any emergencies. John, can you, can you just kind of reinforce what, how the, what the UPS does and why that redundancy is so important? We, we keep UPSs in each of the shelters because the equipment cannot take a glitch. It cannot take a service interruption. Um, the UPSs are rated to run anywhere from two hours at Kelleher up to eight hours at Executive Square. And the reason for the, the difference there is that Kelleher, we have a generator. Uh, Callahan, we have a generator. PD, we have a generator. So we, we rate those to run for two hours because the generator will kick in. And if it doesn't, we can move pretty quickly to, to, to solve it. Uh, we, when we design the system, the UPS component that we put, or cabinet that we put in at Executive Square, we ask for an eight hour rating because there is no generator there. There is a mobile generator that the town has and will go to that site if we lose power at Executive Square, but that's gonna take us four to six hours anyway to get that there, get it hooked up, get it running. Uh, so that, yes. Um, so we, we need UPS units in each of the radio shelters. They're not big ones, uh, but they're a cabinet size, but about the size of a file cabinet. Um, but, you know, just like we have UPS units behind all of our data equipment, we need to have UPS units behind radio equipment. Thank you. I hope that, is that answered? You think that was good, sufficient, Jeff, Gary? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure uh, because mm -hmm. someone, you know, this is a newer council and we did the switch with the UPS last year and started kind of harvesting parts from one system to put it together to run another and with the hope that we could string it along a little bit further. So I wanted a little bit of background. You have the money members. in the current year to start that. I have not pulled the trigger on that. I was going to do okay. that a month or two ago. I have been in contact with the, uh, the company that did the PD replacements to say, hey, I have money budgeted to do one in the PD shelter. That will be the first one. It's the smallest unit. Um, and I'm hoping to get them out before the end of the year so that at least they can issue a PO. Uh, and if we get money in, if, if money survives to do the next one next year, they can at least give me quotes for those two units, one due in, in, out of this fiscal year budget and the next one out of next year's, which will probably, would not probably, will be the Callahan shelter. That is the oldest UPS, and that one has been upgraded hardware and software once already. Um, and even the upgrade, as I said, is end of life by uh, Eaton, which is the manufacturer. So we want to buy new units. So yeah, that's, that's where we're headed with the UPS units. Thank you. Questions? Anybody have any questions? I need to. Hang on. Uh, can we? Uh, I don't know who has the ability to take down the um, sharing screen. There you go. Yep. Now I can see everybody. Anybody have any questions? 
Tom? Just one on, uh, not really on this budget, but on, uh, do you handle the cell tower revenue side of it also, or someone else handles that? That's done. That's done by, uh, uh, well, it was Kathy Natale. It's now uh, Rebecca in the finance department. I do, I work with her a little bit. Um, so it, it dropped down 10 grand for next year. I was just wondering if you knew why. It, um, it dropped down a year or two ago, I think, because of the merger of um, Sprint and Nextel. Um, and, and it may be budgeted for a slight drop this year because Sprint has now merged with um, T-Mobile. T-Mobile rents uh, at our PD location, <coughs> excuse me, and at, uh, at the Kelleher location. Uh, Sprint is also at Kelleher, so there's a possibility they may take one of those sites to them and merge them into one. We may lose yep. some revenue there. We did lose quite a bit. You know, we had cancellations at several sites when Nextel went out of business a few years back. Thanks. Just curious. Yeah, that, that would be the reason. Tom, I'll check that. I'm, I'll check my notes on that one. John, can you just talk a little bit about kind of the market forces around that? I mean, you, uh, it's, yeah, with, with I mean, the companies are coming back to us phenomenon. asking with, to with renegotiate. The collapse, right? With the collapse of the number of vendors out there, uh, something happened about a year ago where a couple of the vendors came to us and said, hey, um, there are fewer vendors out there and we're paying less. So we want to re renegotiate contracts. Um, and we had some attempt by some of them to renegotiate, obviously downward, the rental rates they were paying. Um, one particular one, AT&T came to us and, and wanted to talk about uh, a rental reduction. Um, combined at the same time where another arm of their company was coming and talk about adding a generator so they were requiring more space at the site. So we managed to... to play one against the other and say, look, you can you pay the same rent, but you can have a few more square feet. Uh, one of the other vendors actually did end up uh, pro proposing a reduction too. And I, geez, was that Sprint, Mike? Yeah. Yeah, Sprint was at the end of uh, the third year, the third five-year term, and they had an out in their contract. The, the, the contracts generally run 15, 20, 25, or 30 years with multiple five-year terms. The Sprint contract at the Kelleher site, which, which is probably why that reduction is there, now that I think about it, they were at the 15th year, so they're in the last year of the third five-year renewal, and they said, well, we want to lower it or we're leaving. Um, so they asked for about a one-third reduction, and we managed to negotiate it back up, so it got to be about a I think it was about a 10% reduction. Um, so that's, that's why Sprint dropped. But uh, one of the things they offered was a 2%, no, they offered a 15% escalator every five years, which averages out to three year. I managed to negotiate it back to them to get a two and three quarters percent per year compounded, which means at the end of 15 years, we'll get like 17%. So there was some negotiation that went on and, and, and their rental rate dropped slightly, but not as much as they had asked. So that, that's what was going on with, with the, the market for towers is changing. Um, you're right, Mike. Yeah, that, that, that did cause some of the reduction. Thank you, John. I, uh, anybody else with any questions at all? I had a quick question. Uh, the rental uh, and uh, maintenance, both at Callahan and Executive Square. First at Callahan, that's in Rocky Hill. Yep. Who do we rent it from? Do we rent it from the town or is it rented from a facility? We rent it from Fred Callahan, who owns and operates the bowling alley. That's, that's his mountain. That's his tower site. Okay. And his contract calls for a 
cost of living escalator each year up to a 5% maximum. That's, that's our rental rate to him. Um, the one at Executive Square, we, pay, we don't pay rent to Executive Square. We print, pay rent to a company named uh, SBA Site Management. Uh, it's a firm that goes around and buys access rights to towers and to roofs, and they then control the site. So they, we pay them. Um, and in fact, we have to request access through SBA site management to get into there. It's, yep. it, it's the one site that's a little bit difficult for us to get in and out of. Yeah, so those are the two. We rent at Executive Square and at Callahan. We own at Kelleher and the PD. So we collect money from the cell vendors from those two it, sites. The, the 3% lease is there anything additional to that twelve thousand dollars it looks like it's going twelve thousand to fourteen one which is more than a three percent you know cola or whatever increase what else is included in that increase of twenty one hundred dollars that was from last You know, I have to check on that. That was from twelve thousand to the yeah, current. Even year. low on that number this year. Oh, we were, we were okay. I, I know what it could be in there is that 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 rental that includes electricity in that. So could be that we use more electricity than we planned. No, the electricity is up above. No, no, you're right. The electric. I'm sorry, I'm wrong there. The electricity is shown above. Yeah. Yeah. Just what that yeah, difference i mean three percent gets you up to about twelve three six uh twelve three sixty to fourteen one just what's the difference in that yeah i i can't give you an answer on that okay. right now i'd have to look that up mike look okay yeah yeah that's my only question everything else you know i see um you know, yeah, we're going to make some decisions on radios and battery backup and yeah, maintenance, all that. It's This wasn't a fun project back in when I first got on in 2013. And for years, we were battling it back and forth and yeah. finally got on and now. Well, I've, Mike had asked, and I've given him my priorities for cuts. I don't know if you want me to give them to you again, or you just want to ask him about them later. But uh, yeah, I think places you can take money from if you need to. We can. We can delay things. Okay. Yeah, we'll have that conversation. I think with some deliberations with okay. Mike. Yep. Been there Thank before. You. Okay. I think we're good. All right, thank you. John, you want to you want to address telecom? Uh, sure. I put that up for you. Let me flip to it too. Yeah. Just we uh, John John manages our telecom program as well, so uh, all of that is budgeted in central office, Oops. which is this one. You see that, John? Yep. Um, I think everything is pretty much staying the same there. So we uh, we buy telecom services from Frontier. Uh, that pays for uh, trunk access circuits. Um, AT and T maintains the PBX. You're all aware that we're We've been trying to replace the town's <coughs> telephone system with a VoIP system for several years now. We've got that RFP ready to go out whenever we feel it's appropriate, but uh, you know, we've had to deal with a lot of um, networking issues and, and upgrades to the town's WAN in order to accommodate VoIP. Um, 
but that's all in, in there. Uh, we've also seen some increase in, over the last year or two with um, Verizon Wireless. Even though Verizon, in response to FirstNet, which is the national emergency services or, or, or first uh, responder uh, program, Verizon came back with some uh, price cuts earlier in the year, uh, but we've had to buy more. We we bought some more rate, uh, cell phones, obviously for for COVID issues and other things. But let me say and it, uh, take a minute or two to talk about FirstNet. I don't know if any of you have heard of what FirstNet is. It is a, a national uh, emergency responders. Uh, network. It's supposed network. to tie in radio systems with cell towers and LTE technology and, and make all that stuff uh, a lot more fluid uh, so that you can talk on your radio as a telephone and vice versa. The development of FirstNet is not there yet, um, but first AT&T, which is the awardee by the federal government, of the FirstNet contract. AT&T came in and pitched us a, a little over a year ago to, to convert from Verizon Wireless to their service as the first step. And we were talking to them and about to do it when we heard that several surrounding towns were disappointed with the AT&T service and with the promised rebates and pricing schedules and had flipped back to Verizon Wireless. At that point, we called a halt and said, look, look, the integration of radios and cell service is still not there yet, so there's no emergent need for the town to move to FirstNet on AT&T. So we stepped back and went to, to Verizon Wireless, and, and they said, yeah, we can give you some pricing breaks. And they did do some of that. They, they made uh, some changes, but that's creeping up again. Uh, one of the issues is that we're slowly converting uh, police officers, the, the detectives, the command staff have always had smartphones service. The patrol officers have uh, had flip phones, uh, not, you know, dumb phones, not smartphones. We've slowly been converting some of them, patrol officers, to uh, smartphones in large part because of investigation needs. They need to take pictures. They need to get their emails while they're on the road and stuff and it can be done a lot better from a smartphone. So we're slowly starting to migrate. Uh, and the, the chief has asked time and time again, and I said, as, as we, we'll do it as we can. Um, so that's one of the reasons it's causing an increase in the, in the Veri Verizon wireless service. This is just so everyone knows that $5,000 we added last year for the, when the custodians came over, that's, right. that's in the 42 now. That's, that's why there's an increase from 36 to 42, part of the reason why. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that, that's correct, Mike. Yeah. And there's about, there's about 90 phones in this plan. And then this one is uh, mobile devices. It's the, the iPads and tablets. And we've got about yes. 40 of those deployed right now. Okay. Anybody with any questions? If, if and when we convert to, well, not if, but when we convert to um, a VoIP system, our plan is to bring the library back into the town telephone network. They were once part of the town's telephone system. Um, <coughs> excuse me. When uh, when town hall renovations were done, I think they were. Um, it was decided at that time that that there wasn't sufficient capacity for an additional load. But we're designing a, a a VoIP system that will accommodate the library as well. It will give us the benefit, obviously, of four digit dialing to the library. But we'll we'll consolidate trunking. Right now, they pay for uh, PRIs for trunking. We pay for PRIs for trunking, um, so we can save money that way and, and help 
help the maintenance costs bring that down overall too. So it, systems design, as I said, the RFP is constantly being tweaked, uh, but hopefully we'll get to be able to move on that someday in the next next fiscal year. Okay, good. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Very informative. My pleasure. Camille and Carol, I see Carol. Camille. Hi. How are you? Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Hello. Let me just get to that page. Hang on one second. Okay. Um, pretty cut and dry. Right. I mean, our, our budget's pretty straightforward. It's pretty small. Um, we've actually are decreased a little. Um, and um, we do have one less election this year now, obviously, because of COVID. So um, we'll be combining the August primary with the presidential primary. Um, any additions that we need for um, cleaning and supplies, because obviously the landscape has changed, uh, we will get reimbursed by the state. We have been talking with them almost weekly and we've received paperwork for that. So additional costs, like whether it's sanitizing or wipes or whatever we need, um, the state has sent us forms to get reimbursed for. Okay. Uh, as you can see, um, pretty much everything has held steady. Just the, some money was added to the repairs and maintenance. Um, some was deducted more aligned with what we spend because our, we are always under budget by at the end of the year. Right. If I would just jump in quick, um, that's be and, and you know we we only spent about forty percent of our budget this year, and again because you know we didn't have that primary. That's a big um, that was a big part of it, um, as Carol said. Uh, so yeah, um, that we're going to be combining it. So obviously we will have um, you know the same expenses, but you know just in different <laughs> budget year. Right. So yeah, our budget decreased by about two point eight percent. So yeah, I, I mean it, it's pretty straightforward. I mean we we have a very small department. We we do not have revenue. We you know which we just run the elections. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, like I said, it's pretty straightforward. Kevin. <laughs> Um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I saw Kevin. Oh, Why don't we go, Kevin? Sure, thanks, Mayor. Um, the Secretary of State's office, I know, is already kind of adjusting the interpretation regarding absentee ballots and broadening that interpretation. If the governor um, has an executive order regarding uh, absent, everyone's eligible for absentee ballots, will your office need additional resources? Um, well, I, you know, we're talk. Camille and I are talking about that. It's hard to say at this point. I mean, we do think there'll be an increase in absentee ballots, um, but they are not, it will not be a no excuse absentee ballot landscape, which I think they're kind of sending that message because they're talking about sending them out to everyone, but we do not have, um, no excuse absentee ballot. Uh, you have to have a legitimate reason to vote absentee ballot. So that all, I mean, that is evolving, evolving daily. So we really, at this point, don't know what that's going to look like. And as time goes by and we get closer and see the uh, volume of absentee ballots come in, then we will have to make those decisions about hiring more people 
to count because obviously if we have a huge increase, we will need the staff to count those absentee ballots. Um, and it, oh, go ahead, Carol. No, no, that's all right. I'm done. No, I was going to just jump in and say, you know, like Carol's saying, so much up in the air right now. We do have, well, weekly, it's, this one week was canceled, but at least every other week we're talking to the Secretary of the State on conference calls along with the town clerks. And because the other thing they're talking about, you know, again, this is all in talking phases. If there's going to be so many more absentee ballots, they're talking about maybe, you know, counting them over se for several days. That's something we've never done. And again, that's another thing that we'd have to have, Jeff, you know, governors sort of give an executive order to do, to change all of this. But, you, you know, basically, like Carol said, we would definitely have to hire more people for counting for sure. Um, and I think that this August primary is going to be a little bit more of like a practice session for us. I mean, so that, you know, for November, it's going to really ramp up everything. It stays the same. And even if it doesn't, there's still going to be people that may not want to come to the polls to vote even at that point. So um, it's a lot of unknowns right now with all of that. But we've been, been um, the Secretary of the State has been us up to date with these conference calls every week or so. Thank you both. Any other questions? Amy? <laughs> Hi, Carol. Um, I'm looking. I'm looking at your budget, and you have rentals of polling places going up from three thousand dollars to sixteen thousand dollars. No, no. You got to look at the subgroup. What am I looking at? Oh no, I'm sorry. Um, the, it's it it in that um, professional or support services. There's software maintenance, maintenance which is fourteen eight. Rentals of polling is three and miscellaneous is 3,200. It doesn't show the breakdown. Oh, so the proposed 2021, it's all, it's, well, it can't it's be all the together. Yeah, it's actually, there's a decrease by 3,000 or something dollars here. Um, the support services decreased by 4,140. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. So then you aren't, there isn't really an increase in the rental of polling places like our, our book shows us. No, uh, it no. doesn't show the breakdown. That's not correct. The rental poll of polling places is $3,000. Okay, because I was going to say that's a crazy jump from yes. 16000 to 16000 yeah. no. I'm glad that's not the case. Okay, no. thank you. Somebody needs to talk to the Historical Society for Keeney <laughs> Center. That's the case. Keeney. It's all Keeney. <laughs> And yeah, Keeney is the biggest, yeah, yeah. For sure, which is kind of crazy since I, we own it. But I already had that. I already had. I already made that comment at the last um, at the last budget workshop, Carol. Yeah, it's. It, yeah. I don't get it, but <laughs> we've been trying for years, but doesn't yeah. seem to. All right. Matt, thank you, Matt. Did you have a question? Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm looking, uh, I guess, I understand that the, we all understand that the, the landscape is very fluid right now, but in the next two weeks, we have to make best estimates as to what it's looking like moving forward. And in the past, in the past, I've heard a couple things that there's been a little trouble getting polling workers for the amount that we need. I'm curious, and I don't know if that continues to be true, but I think that's what I've sort of heard. Is that generally still accurate? As far yeah. as you guys know, yeah, I um, we we don't have a huge pool of poll workers. Um, we definitely could use more poll workers, but people are not necessarily dying to do the job. And you know, we haven't. Uh, Camille hasn't heard back from anyone that has said no at this point going forward. But you know, we do continue to try to recruit people when they come in the office. We have something on the website, um, you know, and so far it's been fine um we do have we don't have to use as many poll workers in this upcoming election if need be uh but yeah i mean um it's like you said it's a fluid situation and um we'll have to just see what happens down the road i mean people aren't saying no or yes they're not committing one way or the other and i think you know hour by hour things are changing right now with everything Right, I agree with all of that. Um, I would add, Matt, um, that um, 
We did put in for an increase for our poll workers for um, they, their they rate for their day of work hasn't increased since 2013. So we thought we would try to get them a few extra bucks, um, but obviously not the year to do that. Um, and it isn't, I don't wanna give everybody the impression that you know it's because of money we can't get people because a lot of these people we've had for years and um, they do like coming back, but it just would be nice to, I think it's a little bit more enticing if the money was a little bit higher and we weren't asking for too, too much, but again, uh, you know, that didn't happen. Um, but the other part of this is maybe in this climate where there are people that are, you know, have not been working for a while and maybe they just want their, their home. They may, we may, may have been work, work out for us and we might be able to get more people to work for these next few elections anyway. Um, or this next couple is what I should say. Um, and certainly with the August primary, you know, we have college kids and high school kids are still, you know, maybe home and um, maybe not you know, able to give us their, their time. Um, so we might luck out with that one um, anyhow. But yeah, I mean, you know, it is a little bit of a struggle and we do have a lot of workers that are still, you know, kind of older folks and uh, you know who knows if they would like to you know put themselves out there for in this kind of uh, you know climate so environment so yeah that's, so that's what I'm concerned about is we have it, it does trend uh, older right the the workers a bit, certainly yeah. you get the college kids a few of them and the rest of it but it does trend older we're in a situation where we're gonna have a huge election in 2020 it's a presidential year right and there has been some struggle getting some workers. And it, it seems that you raise the sort of wage for the day and you maybe attract some more, but I'm, I'm a little nervous about sort of, one of our fundamental, of all the things government does, this is like the, one of the most fundamental things that we do in Connecticut is run an orderly election. And I'm a little nervous that if we have this very strange situation where we can't get a lot of the poll workers that you used to get for very regular and normal concerns, we have allocated a certain amount of funds that are is the same as it's been for the last eight years or so. Um, and it puts you guys in a really tough position. Maybe you got to run up a ton of ballots. You're not getting the poll workers and we run a, either we are running a deficit or there's not enough funds there to run a good and orderly election on top of the fact that we all might have to be six, 10 feet apart, long lines, you know, the whole bit. We've never had that in Weathersfield. We see the disasters in other areas. So I'm really interested in ensuring that you guys are properly funded so we have a good and orderly election. And I understand that it's fluid, but I'm looking for your advice as to what you see moving forward. If, because you guys are the ones talking to the Secretary of State and have done this and are so experienced in running great elections in our town, but this is a different year. So what is what do you need moving forward to ensure that we've got a great election? Well, um, I do want to add the Secretary of State did um, say that if we are having trouble getting poll workers, they will assist us in that process. I was just going to say that as well, yes. So that was something that was put out there this week, that they will assist us in getting the required poll workers if we are having trouble on our end. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are a lot of changes coming down the pike. I mean, they're they're thinking about this all the time and meeting all the time and we're submitting questions. So I feel confident going forward that we will continue to run a smooth election. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> no? I'm pretty good. My questions were, yeah, no, just my questions were the same thing. Yeah, but I think we can have some conversations offline just to make sure that everything is ensured, you know, so safe, secure voting is done not only for August, but uh, for November as well. Yes, I agree. Yes, I think going forward, we'll definitely be having more talks and with mm -hmm. you guys and the Secretary of State's office. But um, I do feel confident that everything will run smoothly with the cooperation of everyone involved. And, and the town clerk's office, if I'm not mistaken, Dolores has, does she receive the, the ballots? And yes, correct. The, uh, um, yeah, uh, yeah, she the receives ballots. the ballots. And then we, we, um, 
you know, we obviously count them and we check them in prior to the election to check people off the official list so we know that they voted absentee ballot. So yeah, but the, they col actually collect them and they're yep. sent to her office. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they may require more staff too, depending on, uh, you know, what's going on over there in their office, depending on the volume. But it, it like, I, I do want to reiterate, it is not a new, no excuse absentee ballot um, year. That is, some states do have that, where anyone can vote absentee ballot. That has not changed. Um, they will be sending them out to everyone. Um, so it is kind of a mixed message, but um, it is not a no excuse absentee ballot year. But Carol, isn't, um, hasn't the Secretary of State said that she's working to um, determine what my illness is and the yeah. fact that we have coronavirus in the, in the state may uh, make my illness mean anybody who uh, is concerned that they may get coronavirus then would be eligible to vote by absentee ballot. I think there's like some legal discussion about right. the my illness category on the absentee like his or, ballot. Or her illness or something. They're just wor working to get rid of that little bit of verbiage and then it would make it a different, would read differently. I, yeah, we, we read that. We, 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 got, we got that uh, document from the Secretary of the State, right? But we don't know, you know, how that's going to pan out. Right. Yeah. If it right. does, if it can be done strictly through executive order or does the legislature have to adopt it? Right. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and I think even just over the next few weeks, we're going to get a lot more answers. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I'm good. Are we the last ones this evening? No, no. <laughs> we got wow. and Gary, oh, and I think okay. probably Mike O'Neill is going to stick around for it too. All right, plus the town council budget. Got to go to the town council budget. <laughs> Thank okay, you, everyone. All, All right. right. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. You, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. Gary, what do you want to start off with? Uh, Town Council, Human, Stephanie's here. Well, we'll do Stephanie as part of my, we can do Town Council first since it's quick. I see it as quick. Um, so you guys are aware of what you do, so I don't have to go into the definition of the Town Council and what your role is. Um, very menial increase, uh, salary and wages that reflect the costs for Gail to do our uh, video and recording. Um, with the assumption that we actually have video and recording going forward uh, being done by Gail versus our IT department. Um, at this point, we have to look at the switch over and her comfort level with playing with the system. But as of yet, we haven't allowed um, non-staffing um, levels in because we've been doing this remotely um, and trying to reduce the amount of people from outside coming in. And... Um, just basically the target groups that have most affected COVID individuals were trying to be conscientious of, um, of who's coming in the building. And I think everything else pretty much stayed consistent. CROG and CCM is our regional agency, um, or CROG is our regional agency, CCM is one of our advocates advocates and lobby for our needs at, at a statewide level and even at a national level, uh, providing us information and valuation of and comparison of other communities and what's going on. And like I said, everything else is, is consistent year over year. Happy to answer any questions on that. I have, a, I have a question. Um, so yeah, it's like pretty flat compared to last year, but it looks like there was like a big jump compared to the year before. And I I know you weren't the town manager then, and I don't know if you would know, but why why did it jump so much 
two, you know, from two years ago to last year. And like, even just like supplies and like office supplies and stuff. There's like two different office supplies, general office supplies and other supplies. And that seemed to have gone up a lot. Um, and I mean, what, what does that entail? Or why, why such a big jump? Unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that. But I can look into it and get you a, get your response. Well, like, what is this council donations, dinners, events, flowers, etc.? What is that? Yep. So it's a combination of. Uh, things, but council on a regular basis gets invited to present, to um, to speak at events. Um, they provide gifts, uh, you know, if, uh, memorial donations if uh, an employee has passed away, or um, you know, a longtime advocate for the community. Um, and so, asking the council, which is a volunteer position, to come out of pocket at these things has always been. One of those questions some council members choose to pay on their own. Um, in fairness, we try to make it available. So if a council member wanted to attend the state of the town, as an example, as a formal act in your position, uh, we make those funds available. Okay, thanks. Yep. And they're not always drawn down. I mean, there's carryover right. to next year of that $3,000. Maybe not the full 3000 but we, we typically don't spend down to zero on that, correct? Correct. I usually avoid the word carryover because simply it doesn't carry from one year to the next. It, it falls back or again, at the, end of, at the end of the year, when you look at one department that's over and one that's under, we sweep those funds yep. and make one that's over. Um, Everything lapses. Yeah, mm -hmm. it lapses. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then as far as, yeah, I don't remember Copying, binding, and external, the $9,400 that was in last year's budget, where it was in 1819, because we, we always had the bill insert, we always did the annual report, and the adopted budget. Um, was that in the town manager's budget? We would have to take a look. Oh, the adopted in the report? Yeah, that could be. No, I suspect we just don't spend those lines. I so suspect we just, if we go back to look at the budget for those years, that it was that budgeted at a comparable level. We can check, but those are just actuals. So there's more budgeted than we use. We just use what we need. In other words, you're putting in 8,900 for copy and binding, but in previous years, in 18, 19, you only spent 2,300. So you just put the actual number in there. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, so why do we budget it then? We don't spend anywhere near that amount. Because we don't budget enough overtime and physical services. You can't anticipate snowstorms, you can't which anticipate is a, protests, you can't anticipate fires. You can take it out. <laughs> kind of makes the budget. Again, that's why at the end of the year you go through and you say, here and here, where is it? Why wouldn't you go through it and say, well, it should be in physical services or because we never use it in town you can't, town. you can't tell. You can't tell where it's going to be. This year, our labor budget is blown through the, through the water because we had a police involved shooting and multiple protests. And <clears> so <throat> it might not be a physical service. It couldn't be a police. So you do it based off of estimates. Um, you know, unfortunately with public budgeting, you have to set a budget. It becomes something that's a legally binding document. You can't go back really and ask for more. Um, and you don't want to be short. Well, I, I would say that for the council donations, dinners, events, and flowers, the amount is, is you know, less than 
the proposed budget's less than 300 per council member, I suppose, I mean, I've never asked for any reimbursement, but if I sat down and, and figured out how much I've paid out of pocket in one calendar year, it would be way more than $300 for the events I've attended. So you would need to budget in some amount if you're, if you're telling nine people that we can get reimbursed when we, when we go to the state of the town breakfast or when we go to the um, best of Weathersfield dinner at the country club acting in our official capacity. You do need to build in a budget in case all nine of us do seek reimbursement for all of the different events we go to. Um, but I, I did choose not to have that tax bill insert last year. Um, so that that would be money coming back to you because it looked to me like it was a campaigning tactic. So I chose not to do the tax bill insert, but um, you know, I understand why we would need to fund these things if we ask people to attend town events that incur cost. Yeah, I was looking at the copy and binding costs where you have a track record of a couple thousand dollars and but you budget 9400 All right. So if you look at 1718, it almost doubles from one year to the next. And I can't tell you why it's doubling. But again, it's, it's an unanticipated um, number. I mean, we can take it out, we can reduce it. You kind of have to estimate. Um, I don't have a history in front of me. So I can't say if there were previous years where we were that high, you know, or we were five grand or we blew it out. But I can research it just to see where we've always been. Yeah, I guess I'm just having trouble wrapping my head around the concept of you have to pad other budgets because of your, you know, trying to account for the unknown. Yeah, I don't, and I don't so much think it's it's padding any one budget over another. I think it's just, you know, when, when you look at where the numbers are, um, you, you really just don't know. Um, with a new council, you might decide that you want everything printed. You want more... Uh, paper copies of the budget to distribute to people versus the 10 or 12 or 12, 33, you know, whatever the number is to make it available to people. Um, you put it in a budget. You know, if we start making copies of a 300 page document double sided with color, uh, it might be something more, more expensive. If you guys decide you want to market things differently, you know, you kind of have to have it in there. How many copies of the budget did we print this year? I want to say 33 or 36. Uh, Cheryl, I don't know if you're still on. Yes, 36. 36. 36. Uh, so nine went to 10. I would imagine with Gary, Mike, 11. Town clerk. Clerk. So that probably leaves 20 from sitting on a table. Yep, so the library, the library gets a handful, town clerk gets a handful, uh, Bob Young gets one, um, anyone who asks, so we make them available. How many people have asked, we know? You probably don't know from Dolores or from Brooke. Yeah, you also have to keep in mind we're closed. Right, so, yeah, not, yeah. Gary? Door, doors are closed, yeah. I can, I can tell you we've had two public requests for um, proposed budget books. Um, that is Bob Young and another gentleman in town. Um, the library traditionally gets three copies. Town clerk gets two. Um, each department traditionally gets a proposed budget. Uh, we right now have three or four in the office for public disperse it disbursement if requests arrive. Got it. Okay. That explains it. I didn't want 34 of them or whatever. It would be 24 of them sitting on a table waiting to be picked up by nobody yeah so at least they go to the departments and they they avail themselves four or five copies to uh, to the public okay thank you <clears throat> safe grad amy still going on this year we're waiting to hear if graduation is going on this year 
<laughs> we actually have a safe grad meeting tomorrow night. We're going to look at plan A and plan B and see what's happening. But like everybody else, we're waiting for the governor and the, you know, to determine what's safe and when. So we're hoping maybe later in the summer we'll be able to have a graduation and a uh, safe grad, but that's up to, you know, principal will determine the graduation and then safe grad can work off of that. Yep, got it. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, thank you. Town manager, you want to go? Yep. So let me do my little overview and then we'll ask. So town manager's department uh, office is combined of uh, obviously town manager functions as well as human resources. Um, we manage the day-to-day -day operations of the town side of things, uh, everything but the Board of Ed and a carve out for the library, although Brooke uh, spends a lot of time coordinating with this office as well as human resources. Um, ultimate role, directing department heads in the effective operations of services. We look to bring collaboration, uh, collaborative approach, some problem solving skills and looking for opportunities to reduce duplication of services. Um, a lot of resident uh, dealing with resident and business issues, trying to redirect requests to the appropriate departments. Uh, we answer questions as we can, if, but if they're more technical in nature, we provide um, the direction to the right department. Uh, but ultimately, we're the clearinghouse for all information coming through, uh, whether it's state, federal, local, resident, or business. Um, the HR function is a high focus on the looking at human resource uh, functions, uh, human resource capital concerns, managing talent, uh, labor negotiations. Obviously, I'll let uh, my partner in crime, um, Stephanie, who's on the line, answer some questions, but we have seven unions, um, at least on our side. Uh, and then I know Stephanie works with the Board of Ed with some of that component, a lot of mediation, arbitration, uh, focus on discipline, uh, health, medical benefits, enrollments, question and answers. We are your first stop for retirement and pension issues for the 200 some uh, employees at work here, plus retirees who are, um, who are history, but still part of our future as we work through things. Uh, a lot of policy creation and enforcement comes through this office. We work to set clear expectations about what's acceptable and we help hold people accountable to meeting those expectations. Um, and right now with COVID, uh, more often than not, we've, we've dealt with this in smaller doses, but the reality is right now it's all about procedural changes, what's coming up on uh, in order to meet both state, federal, and local changes so that we can be responsive to the needs of uh, residents and businesses. We also provide a level of administrative support to departments. Right now, uh, departments are very thinly staffed and we end up becoming that collective group that works together. Who else is gonna do it? Okay, we'll figure out how we're gonna do that in-house. Uh, unfortunately for Cheryl, a lot of that does fall on her, but it is, it is a group effort. Um, so that's all departments, especially a high focus on blight and zoning. Right now that officer has no direct clerical support. So a lot of that falls on, um, on Cheryl um, and or reporting to me. Uh, so there's a lot of hand-holding as part of that. We obviously provide administrative support as needed to the town council. Uh, on my side, just because of my background, also working with economic development team as a, as a whole, which includes coordinating with RDA, EDIC, planning, zoning, building, uh, engineering, fire marshal, to look at opportunities to change our programming, to change our internal process, look at ways to <coughs> stimulate the private, private sector growth. Um, always looking to find ways to stabilize the tax base. So it's kind of a team effort. So for lack of a better definition, and I know I ran through that quickly, we're really the operational center, but we're also the, I've always referred to us as the junk drawer in your kitchen. Everything kind of falls in there. It's the first place you look for things you, you um, you know, when you're looking for something, you go to that drawer, you open it up, hopefully you find the thing you're looking for. If not, uh, we're looking to find a way to create solutions to these problems. So um, 
that's kind of the thumbnail. Um, I'll let Stephanie, if you want to do an overview of some of the HR stuff, and then we'll kind of pop into the budget, that might be the easiest way. Thank you. Good evening. I wanted to provide you with uh, an outline of the responsibilities of the Human Resources Department. Um, as you know, it is a one-person department. Um, the town manager and I do share the uh, Cheryl, um, in addition to her also offering the administrative support that uh, the town manager has just spoke of. Um, as far as recruitment, from March 19 to March 20, there was 34 recruitments. This encompasses both internal and external. Um, internal recruitments are when a position opens within a department and there's an opportunity for employees within that union to put in for that position. When a recruitment is started, uh, a posting has to be created, the job description has to be reviewed, um, the review applications during the same time frame of March 19 uh, to March 20, uh, there was over 326 applications that were received. Um, we also organize and administer and even write written examinations as well as conduct oral panels. Um, so there, we provide all correspondence to all the applicants four positions to let them know where they stand in the process, what they scored during different uh, processes within the recruitment process. There is also onboarding and offboarding. Um, onboarding is we're doing before somebody's onboarded actually. There's a background process that involves pre-employment physicals, um, a background, criminal inquiry, um, pre-employment physical and a drug test as well. Onboarding is the orientation aspect. So during that time, the individual, the new employee is enrolling in all of the benefits. And often it takes um, a bit of time to explain the various benefits, how our insurance program works uh, and answer any questions they may have. Offboarding um, consists of processing someone out regarding insurance and the pension that they're under, whether it be a defined contribution or a defined benefit, what type of insurance they're going to go under as a retiree if they are available um, to receive that. This past, uh, I'm sorry, this current fiscal year, uh, there was a police promotional process for sergeant and lieutenant. Um, and we also did a, a pretty significant police officer oral panel. What an oral panel is, just so that there's an understanding, um, according to Charter, there are three individuals that serve as panel members and then human resources oversees it. So there's the creation of questions, the validation of questions to make sure those questions um, are relevant to the position. There's scoring involved, and of course, correspondence after everything is scored to let the candidate know where they, what they scored and where they fall in the process. Um, we did a dual panel uh, for police officer meeting. We had two oral panels going at one time. We were able to interview 35 candidates in a two-day time period. Um, from that oral panel, um, we had two individuals, two new employees start today in the police department um, and they'll be leaving for the academy this, this I think at the end of this week. Uh, we have two additional candidates that are in background to possibly go into the police academy if we can get seats in the June academy. Um, today there was an oral panel for about nine entry level and on Wednesday there's another oral panel scheduled and we're going to be interviewing seven certified officers and what that means is they're currently police officers. Uh, they're looking to come transfer to Weathersfield to become Weathersfield police officers. In addition to the rec recruitment, another um, area that this department is responsible for is Benefits administration, again, I spoke about uh, the enrollment aspect of onboarding someone with health insurance, um, dealing with any long-term disability insurance issues, as well as life insurance issues, um, the defined benefit, 
pension, the defined contribution pensions. We have various plans as well as an IRA plan. Um, to give you an example of some of the different things as far as time consumption, um, our insurance agent of record, Chris Monroe with USI, had done some research. Um, we looked at doing a prescription carve-out program, which essentially means taking the pharmacy benefit management from Anthem and moving it to Express Scripts. Um, to educate employees on this, there was seven WebEx meetings that were conducted. Um, we recorded one of those WebEx meetings and I sent it via email to all employees. And then after that, we had two follow-up web WebEx meetings um, to offer as question and answer sessions. So employees would have the opportunity to ask any questions that they may have in regard to the prescription carve-out program. Um, a significant amount of time is spent with labor relations. As the town manager alluded to, we have seven different unions. Uh, we took on that seventh union about, I think it was about a year and a half ago when we um, took on the custodians from the Board of Education. Uh, this current fiscal year, we have concluded contract negotiations with the police and started contract negotiations with our physical services unit. Right now, we are in a mediation process. Uh, we were set for mediation in February, but due to COVID, uh, that has been suspended until everything uh, reopens again. And I think at that time to get a hold of a mediator, they're gonna be backed up at the state. So I think unfortunately, that's gonna be a very long process. Um, this current fiscal year, we had a termination arbitration hearing upon which the town prevailed. So. Uh, employee was terminated, the employee filed a grievance, it went to arbitration, uh, there was a hearing, uh, briefs had to be written, that's done by legal counsel, and again the town prepared on, uh, prevailed on that arbitration hearing. Um, I am the chief spokesperson for the seven different unions, um, so when we're in negotiations I uh, formulate proposals and meet with the town manager, and we discuss different aspects of what we're going to propose and, and define some uh, perimeters upon which we're going to negotiate. And then also if we go to an interest arbitration, which is an arbitration hearing over not being able to essentially settle the contract, patents director, um, making many different graphs and exhibits that we have to enter into enter in uh, during the arbitration. Of course, there's also the grievance process. Uh, the human resources manager is generally step three. Um, there are situ or there's different contracts where the town manager is step two or three in the grievance process. And if it is the town manager, then uh, the town manager and I work together on that. There's also risk management. Um, all workers comp, as soon as a workers comp cases filed, I receive an email um, indicating what has happened at the end that it's been filed with KERMA um, so that we can follow up or I can follow up with the department to make sure that if the individual has gone for medical treatment, uh, can we accommodate that light duty restriction if they are on a light duty restriction and making sure that they attend the appointments they need to and that once they are released from a light duty status and they're back on full duty, um, they are bringing that documentation in um, because light duty, when someone is on a light duty status, obviously they're not working to their full capacity. Um, this department is also responsible for legal compliance regarding different employee, well, I would say all employment matters, policy administration, we belong to DOT, the Department of Transportation, Drug and Alcohol Testing Program, as we have commercial driver's license holders within our physical services department. So there is a whole program that we have to adhere to in regard to that. Um, let's see, as the town manager indicated as well, um, when the Board of Education is in negotiation with their four unions, I attend those negotiations and act as a representative of the town in regard to the defined benefit pension. 
Uh, this department is also responsible for administering the Family and Medical Leave Act, which requires a lot of paperwork and a lot of time to administer. Um, attend, attend different pension committee meetings, OPEB committee meetings, safety committee meetings, member of the EOC. Um, I think that about sums it up. Um, this coming fiscal year, um, we'll be continuing with the mediation in our physical services department. And then we'll also be beginning negotiations with our supervisors in our town hall dispatch unit. Uh, their contract is actually set to expire June 30th of this year. So due to COVID, things have been uh, essentially stopped at the state level as far as mediation. And um, we have not started negotiating the supervisors or town hall dispatch, uh, again, due to COVID and needing to, everybody's kind of had to re, re um, change their focus on what they've been doing. There has been a lot that this department has been involved with as far as COVID um, with regard to employees and emergency paid sick leave and the emergency extended FMLA notification on that that was changing on a almost daily basis from the uh, federal, I forgot now who it is, <laughs> from the federal level with their guidance uh, Department of Labor. Thank you. Department of Labor, yeah. Do well. Uh, it was changing on an almost daily basis, and it was uh, it was very interesting. Um, it continues to change, so we continue to put out more information to employees, um, and then gathering all the documentation uh, so that we can put in for reimbursement on the emergency paid sick leave and the emergency extended FMLA as well. Can I, it, does anyone have any questions as far as um, any responsibilities or uh, of the department? So Stephanie, I, Stephanie, what don't you do? Did I do <laughs> you do you do a tremendous job and you have such a responsibility. Oh thank you. So when you look at the budget we have Three and a half FTEs, full-time equivalents here. So it's myself, it's Stephanie, it's Cheryl, and we have a part-time floater who um, will be in here. And then usually in the library for here or there, although with everything going on, she's been in here um, and kind of part of, uh, part of the team. Um, and we're trying to coordinate kind of central functions, uh, what I had mentioned, what Stephanie had mentioned. Uh, and we're spread in probably every direction you have to wear. Um, you almost have to be a was it like a kind of a yeah. expert in just about everything, but, or, you know, no, a little bit about it. Jack, yeah. Um, so, you know, as such coming in the door, uh, there were a lot of conversations prior to my arrival about making some adjustments, um, salaries, um, the budget on paper, when you look at it has from 1920 to 2021 has a, has a big jump. It's, it really is an unfair, uh, way to depict the jump because it looks like it's all happening next year. Uh, the reality is some of this stuff was in motion about mid-year um, because coming in when I came in it, with everything going on, you know, it was unfair to really give me an opportunity to evaluate my my team, my immediate team here. Um, but with that discussion from, um, you know, that had been going on prior to my arrival, it made sense to to do the increase. So there was an actually increase to their salaries, which um, about mid-year. So what you're seeing here on paper is what seems to be a really huge jump. The reality is it's it's going back to last year and then uh, some merit increase and some recommendations for next year. Um, so uh, yeah, anyway, it was really trying to create that standard, put a standard in place um, um, and, and raise it to a really inappropriate level. So with that, um, I'm happy to go to answer questions or go line by line, depending upon how you guys want to handle it. Anybody have any questions? Kevin? Thanks, Mayor. Um, Gary, uh, do you, the, the labor relations align, I know you, physical services and the dispatchers are this year. Um, just the trend from 17, 18, 18, 19, 19, 20, you know, 
can you just, I mean, is that 12,000? Uh... Yeah, we're going <laughs> to blow it out. You know, to, to the deputy mayor's point, right, it's, it's kind of like, uh, I think the average that I looked at over the last five years were somewhere around 45,000. Um, you know, and Stephanie can tell you, you, you have one year where you end up going to arbitration um, and you're spending forty, fifty thousand dollars just in arbitration to work with the unions to try to get, you know, to get an agreement on the table. Um, I've always appreciated Stephanie's approach um, to how she does it. She tries to start off with small things. Here's the top twelve thing, you know, five five things that I'd like to see. The union does the same, and then um, if all goes badly and we can't come to an agreement, we go through a mediation process, and then we go to arbitration. Um, and then we throw the kitchen sink in. It's kind of like you guys didn't want to come to the table. So now we're asking for everything. Uh, the reality is we've had some successes, but it costs money, right? You've got to bring your big guns to the table to try to win at every uh, angle. And I'm really, I shouldn't say win because ultimately I, I can't say there's really a winner um, in the situation. You're talking about your, your people who get things done. They're your workforce. Um, but ultimately, our job is to try to keep things in check as best we can. Um, we have a number in there for 12,000. Um, you know, my estimation, you raise a good point with what we have coming down the pipeline next year, we're going to exceed it. Um, is it, is it I, I know we will. It seems like it's similar, like with Sally, with how they, she budgets for anything that's weather related. You just, you just don't know, so you just kind of, is that kind of similar? You're just, you're finding kind of just any number and it is what it is? Yeah, I mean, I, in other municipalities I've worked for, I've looked at a five-year trend um, to see, and you could base it off the five-year trend. At the same time, the other end happens, which is, so if you if you buck the trend, um, or you go down, or you go too high, now, now you've kind of hit, you've really hit the taxpayer harder than you wanted to. Um, you know, like I keep saying, at the end of the year, we tighten everything up. Um, if, you, if you put your averages in there across the board, I, I can't say that you're, you're going to be low. You're going to you're going to be too high, and you can't give that money back. It is what it is. Right. So, um, it it is you know even coming on board here last year, I struggled and asked that same question. Why don't we use the average? I understand why you wouldn't, um, but uh, but it becomes dangerous. It, it can very quickly go the other way. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Kevin. Anybody else? Mary. I have a question. I just, I, you already touched on this a little, Gary, but I just wanted you to just to clarify something with the, with the salaries, HR manager and executive secretary. Um, it, cause you know, it looks like we're talking a 11 and a half percent raise and a 12 and a half percent raise respectively. Yeah, I do like so, these guys, but not that much. So this is, so you're saying the, that this is over like a year and a half or basically two years worth of raises or what's, I mean, I just. So I think the conversation started taking place previously, which was what, what is a responsible salary range based off of the, the value added, um, where they are comparably within the own, within this structure and outside of the structure for, for what gets brought to the table. Um, you know, when you look at what the HR manager, for example, has accomplished um, in the five years that she's been here in terms of the dollar amount saved um, and what's been negotiated um, going forward, you know, it's probably 10 times the, the amount. Um, in fairness, when you look at her position compared to other department heads and, you know, ultimately she's qualified as a manager, but she's essentially a department head. She's just one of the person reporting uh, uh, to me, um, you know, it's about putting that to where it should be. Uh, and same thing with Cheryl. Um, you're looking at Cheryl supports me. She supports Steph. She supports the council. She supports Blight. And she supports, uh, and she's doing straight constituent service. Uh, the reality is she's more of, an, uh, more of a higher level than she actually is. Um, you know, you, because they're in the admin group, um, they've taken zeros multiple years where others have not. Um, and so, you know, you look to retain the talent, you look to pay them what is reasonable for what they provide. Um, 
you know, you kind of have to balance the amount of hours. There's days where both of these guys on a regular basis, I mean, Cheryl probably more often than me. She's here later some days than I am. I mean, she's in earlier. Um, I call her on a weekend. I send her an email on a weekend for Monday, and she comes into the office on a Saturday to answer it. Um, you know, and I, Steph's the same way. She, now with VPN, it's probably even worse for both of them. I'm kind of an obnoxious manager. I have a lot of questions on the weekend, figuring they'll hit me on Monday, and they come right back. So, um, so anyway, to your point, um, the conversation started before I came in. I came into it. I wanted a chance to evaluate before we moved on to it, um, and I ultimately agreed to it. Okay, no, I, I know they're both awesome. I just I just think of the optics of this in a time when, you know, we're looking at a 20% unemployment rate and those who still have jobs in the private sector have, met, many people have had their salaries reduced. And to it just does look excessive. And for this, the time that we're currently living through and the economic devastation all around us plus with yeah. union negotiations coming up i i just wonder what the union <laughs> negotiators are going to say oh you want us to take a one percent or you know whatever you know look at what you're you know that i just i just think it's so, curious because i haven't seen it in, from any of the other budgets for any of the other departments that's yeah all. It, it really uh is unfortunate i just i didn't even think about it when it came out um that it actually um I didn't, I didn't look closely enough to, I knew what the number was. So this number actually includes an increase for next year, Mike, I believe, right? All admin have 2% over what they're currently earning. Right. So budget. what you're seeing, so uh, uh, Council Pelletier, to your point, what you're seeing is essentially a two-year increase reporting in one year, but it's really, it's really not. It's just the way it looks optic because this printed paper makes it look like, um, make it looks. I don't know for financial standards or accounting standards if we had to do it that way, um, or if it was something I just actually didn't catch uh, coming out, because I just knew the number off the top of my head, so I didn't think about well, I, that. Wait, but my, um, Mike O'Neill, you, you just mentioned it's that all the admins are getting a 2% raise, so that would be like a 4% or 2% over 2%, maybe 5%. But this is substantially higher. I don't know. I just, the numbers just. Because the, the numbers that you're looking at for fiscal 20 is what was budgeted for fiscal 20. Oh, right. but it was not. Oh, but they already received more than that for fiscal yeah. 20. Is that so, correct? Okay. Right. I see. I see. Right. So the so increases those... put them above the 20 budget. So we sit down when we budget 21, we look at. I look at what I'm making today, and I add two percent to it. Okay, so from and that's what I budget for twenty one. And so it's really only up two percent, but this budgeted amount for nineteen twenty is just wrong. Or it, no, it's right. Well, it, it was what was. Or it was. I'm sorry, it was budgeted. Budget. But the actuals, the actuals it, are right because they are okay. All right, okay. right. So the get. So it wouldn't if I had. And I, it, pro it might not have been correct to do so, but if I had put it in where we're, they were, the, the gap would be smaller and it wouldn't have been a thought. Um, yeah, but but this is a better way to, what's that? That wouldn't be the 20 budget though. Right, I, I agree, I agree. But the dollar amount where they're, go where they're at now and where they're going is much smaller than what this budget reflects, which is appropriate because that's what we budgeted on paper, to Mike's point. It just, it, it to, it does the optic looks makes it look quirky yeah. actuals are above budgeted amounts for correct. fiscal year 20. correct yep and, and actually i'm trying to go through last year's and this year's to try and reconcile and i'm i'm racking my brain so i couldn't figure it out thank you for answering that yeah we do see a drop though in actual ninth fiscal year fy19 and that is kathy bagley coming in partial of the year correct the drop down from actual eight fy18 317 down to fy19 291 i would imagine that it's the town manager had left and we had an interim in 
and then yeah. you came and then in. And jumped back up in 19, yep, 1920. Goes back up FY20, which would have been only just a couple months of you. <clears throat> yep. Did we have to pay him out or something? For what? No. FY20 is, FY20 is, Gary was here all of FY20. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. FY19, yes. You would have only been there for like three months, four months. Got it. I'm trying to, yeah, add it calendar in my head. Got it. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions on any other line items in there? I'm good. Mayor, before we yeah. um, before we leave, um, are we going to ask the Board of Ed to prepare some scenarios for budget cuts um, that they can share with us when we have our conversation with them on Wednesday. I know, um, you know, in the past it's been helpful to see different scenarios and if counselors are considering um, cuts to the Board of Ed, it might help us in making decisions if we know some, some possible areas that would be cut um, at different levels. You know, if we gave the Board of Ed a couple different mm -hmm. scenarios we were interested in and work on uh, their thoughts for them. Yeah, I saw a couple emails come in about that today. I'm not asking any scenarios from them at all. Um, I talked with uh, both Mike Emmett and with uh, Board of Ed leadership on the direction that uh, they were planning on going and the kind of the direction that we want to go or we would like to see go. Um, I mean, I think I've heard and seen from uh, from your side where you guys want to be with it, so. Um. Well, my, my, my asking that is um, so that people in the public know what are potential cuts that could be coming down. If we cut the Board of Ed 500,000, what's at stake? A million, what's at stake? Two million, I believe, is the magic number to get to a zero budget increase. So what what are those cuts going to look like before we vote on um, before we vote on a budget for the Board of Ed, I'd like to have an idea of what those cuts would be like. And I think we owe it to the public to let them see what a uh, $500,000 or $1 million cut to the Board of Ed budget would be. Just like I want to know what that, you know, what a large budget cut would do to the town side or what a budget cut would do to the um, library side. I'd like to have as much information as I can before I make a decision. Okay. I mean, we can, I mean, it's at the discretion of the board or at the uh, the superintendent of what those, what he intends to cut. Um, I mean, we haven't given him a, a number where we want to be. Um, I mean, I keep hearing from people about a 0%. I don't think I've ever seen a 0% budget proposal out there. So uh, I, I don't Well, know. I'm not in any way advocating for it, but when, when you, I, you know, when we as, elected officials keep hearing rumors about something, um, it's, it's good to either I don't, put I don't the board to my, bed or to... Um, I tend know. not to base a budget on rumors. Mike, you said that you talked to the Board of Ed leadership and that you were trying to formulate, you know, what it might look like. What, what do you think it is? Look, what is it looking like? Well, they're realizing some savings from not being in school, so... Sure. Any, gu any guidance on that? Uh, as I start to get it, and I think as, as we start to deliberate, I definitely think on Wednesday we would get a better picture on where we would be. Okay. Talking Thanks. with both the board and us together. Anybody else? Gary? Uh, if no other council, uh, we still have to actually finish up Mike O'Neill's finance stuff. Okay. 
Everybody thought we were done. But can, we, can we lump it in with education this time? <laughs> How about five minutes? Three <laughs> departments in five minutes. Now. <laughs> also, I'm going to call John Eichner ask to this and ask him how I use this walkie-talkie because I only have partial access. <clears throat> and I think I have the older model. So very quickly, I could talk about paper and postage all night, but just uh, so you can see uh, the other components of central office is just, uh, that's our copier leases and paper, not much of a change there. Postage, um, fairly stable. We knocked that down a little bit from where we were this year. And then at the bottom is just some more stationery that's down uh, down there. Uh, bear with me. Get another share. I just want to show you pension. I'll just show you a couple of things that uh, so you can see how they come together. The pension number. Everybody can see that. Uh, this is just, uh, I don't think I distributed this. We, uh, but I will, our actuaries uh, every year as of July 1st, prepare a valuation of the pension plan, which basically looks at the assets, the value of the assets, and then the future value um, of the benefits to be paid and uh, calculates what the contribution should be for a year, each year. Um, we contribute uh, what the actuaries tell us should be contributed. Bond rating agencies like to see that. Um, the auditors like to see that. Um, this is the number uh, in the current year in the fiscal 20 budget, $3 million. Um, the, the valuation for uh, July 1st, 19 is not finalized yet. Um, we have a couple of options here. Uh, I prefer plan A. Uh, there's two things that we have to do. These two yellow lines, that, two things, uh, assumptions that have to change. The assumed rate of return that we're using right now is 6.75%. They want us to come down to 6.25. You can see that. Um, and then the other thing is the mortality table. Uh, Actuary has been talking about this for several years. Mm -hmm. They're gonna go from something they call RP2000 to pub 2010, um, which basically assumes, uh, reflects the fact that uh, government workers live a lot longer uh, today than they did back in the year 2000, um, which means we pay benefits for longer, and which means we have to put more into the, into the, uh, into the fund. Um, so what plan A would be a full implementation of the mortality table and no change on the interest rate for fiscal 21 and then to bring the interest rate down uh, to 6.5% in fiscal 22. The other option would be a partial phase in of the mortality table, partial change in the interest rate. Um, plan A, you, that, that significant increase that you're seeing uh, in all the departments for pension is, is uh, Overall for Board of Ed included is an 18% increase. Um, next year would be an, uh, roughly 18% more under plan B. It's a 15% increase this year, but a 22% increase next year. Um, so again, our, our recommendation would be to, uh, to, you know, implement this mortality table completely this year and then start working on the interest rate in fiscal 22. Any questions? One more stop. <laughs> Mike, are we, are we going to make the same assumptions from a tax collection rate? Uh, uh, this I, year and prior? With the proposed budget, goes back, despite all your work last year, Matt, um, goes back because of the, uh, because of the change, you know, obviously the change in the economy, 
yeah. and uh, and everything back to 98.65 percent from the I think we do we increase to 99.1 yeah, yeah, I think that's right, considering the situation, uh, no doubt. And that's why I was just... Yep. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I thought that there should be a little bit of uh, adjustment there to, to handle what is expected, I think. Yep. Uh, this number is the department we call transfers out. That's the uh, CIP and CNEF. And I just want to show you how all these tie together. You know the, the 574,000, that, that's what last year was 900,000. You've seen that list that we reduced. The other one is the CNEF table that we've looked at a number of different times, the 1.3 million. I just want to take you to that. And um, there's the 1.3 million there. I want to point out a couple of things. Nowhere. So this column is, is what would be in the budget, so to speak. And what you'll notice is not in this column is that phone system right there. So that's not something that's included in the budget. It's it's in the plan, so to speak, and it's put. We just put it in the column with, for lease financing. That's a decision that uh, the council will make. You know, whenever whenever it's made, whenever it's brought to council, um, how that's funded. Um, but just wanted to be clear that uh, you know eliminating the phone system or putting it off for a year will not change uh, anything in the budget. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is the lease payments. That's all of these numbers up here uh, included in your tab in the front of your binders with additional information is this schedule, which is those are the total lease payments, that 1.4 million. What we do then is we use reserves to offset that. So the net amount is the 1.36,000. Uh, 1, that's, that's if you add these numbers up, you get the 1,036,000. And I just, what I want to point out is that we use reserves to bring that number down. And this table at the bottom, if you study it, and you should, uh, just shows you where we are on reserves. Um, we are quite a bit lower. There's three accounts that we make use of uh, for the lease payments. And you can see here, if you go back to last July 1st, 400,200 and 553, and those numbers are down substantially um, if we use the reserves in, uh, in the proposed budget. And the reason they're down is because, uh, because of these items, we stopped leasing. So these items right here come directly out of reserves because they were not budgeted uh, last year. They were proposed for leasing. Um, so, and I just, I just made a note here. The last time we did a lease was in December of 2018. And that was the police cars in the, that were from the 19 budget and the two fire engines, which we're going to take delivery on here um, next month or the month after. So we do well. I can explain this or, or walk through this again another time, but I just wanted to, to point that out to you. And I am done. Mike, is that in our budget? I'm sorry. Is that in the budget book? Yes, yes. it's in that it's in that front tab that says additional information. All right. Just because it was difficult to kind of focus on in there. Mike, are you, are you indicating that that it might be aggressive to? Uh, budget the current that that section the current way that we have it budgeted that there's a uncomfortable risk tolerance there I guess you might say I think I'm going to go back to that bear with me Matt and I, I suppose you can sort of put it another way if you were budgeting it uh, I am budgeting it you are budgeting it though right but I guess yeah is it um, uncomfortable risk tolerance then what's not here is what we would expect um, to be unexpended at the end of 20. So the way this works, here we are in May, the, the fiscal year ends next month. Um, we kind of clean up the, the records and the books in July, and then we come to you in August with uh, funds that have not been expended from the 20 budget. This is typically where that money goes. And you can see, 
um, right there, if you look at this line, you can see that we put, um, you know, actually these first two lines are kind of, in time they happen in the opposite order. So, so this is, these, this is, these are the reserves that you used last year, the 200, 149, and the, and the 267. And you can see what we did a couple months after the budget was adopted and those numbers and those amounts were used is we took leftover 19 money and put it back in there. So we used 200 for 20 and we had 200 that we put back in from 19. And similarly, we had uh, 267 that we used in the CNEF reserve and we put 345 back in that was unexpended from the 19 budget. So that's that's the only thing. The reserves are lower. I mean, um, they're lower, but don't forget in CNEF, there's a number of, and in CIP, there are projects that uh, that you have budgeted for that are in you know various states of planning and or execution. Um, if we ever, you know, if reserves ever got too low, um, you know, money could be you know redirected from other projects to um, you know to whatever the need would be. So, I mean, it's all things considered, Matt. It's nice to have reserves. I mean, it's uh, you know, but this was something that we. We had talked about we we're going to, you know, see uh, if we could go without leasing for a couple of years and where that would put us. And uh, this is where it puts us. Okay. Kevin? Thanks, Mike. Um, Mike O'Neill, the um, those reserve funds do they? I, I'm I'm confused in terms of how they are budgeted. Are they? Is it part of the budget reserve fund, or are those all separate um, line items, so to speak, within our general fund budget? Let's go back. I'll take you through that, Kevin. So. So we, the way we develop it, Kevin, is we, they, these are the actual payments here, right? These, well, let me get my whole thing again. These are the actual payments for the leases. And then we look at reserves and we take this amount and we say, let's use, let's use this to offset those payments. Yeah. This is what we're going to put in. So again, this column is what goes, this is in your budget. So it's it's the net amount um, here, which is gotcha. you know these are the actual this is the actual payment one point four six eight Th those are those reductions from reserves that's what's budgeted. I got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Anybody else? Good. Okay. We're officially two minutes longer than last last time. We're we're getting. Well, we had radio. Radio took up a, a good amount. <laughs> it did. It did, Mike. It took up yeah. a lot of time. Glad Still haven't been. learned how to work this thing. <clears throat> okay. Um, make a motion. We can just recess until Wednesday night, 6 p.m. So moved. Second. I'll second it. Come on, guys. Second. Thanks, Mary. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right. We're recessed until Wednesday night. Thank you.